So I will call the Finance Committee to order at 5.07 p.m. for February 26, 2024. You want to do the select board? Yes. I will open that, open that at uh, 5.08. All righty. First order of business is um, review of minutes. Um, Jim, do you wanna? All right, I'll move that we uh, uh, accept the minutes of the uh, February 19th, no, February 12th meeting. We have a second? Second. Any discussion? Um, since we're hybrid, we're gonna have to do a roll call vote. Um, so if we'll just start down here with Jim, just like instead of me calling your name, <laughs> James Camby is I. Nardowitz I. Beth Brown I. Mark Brennan I. Julie Chalfant I. Dave. Dave Sharp I. John. John, John Pereski I. That's unanimous seven zero zero. Well, here. Excellent. All right. So, with that out of the way, we are going to move to the senior center budget. Okay, that's so, account number 541-5420 for $90,299. For Deerfield's portion. All right, so do we have a motion? I move that we recommend the sum of $90,299 for a senior center expense, account number 541-5420. We have a second. Second. All right. We're ready for you. Discussion? Okay. Um, so the biggest changes that you'll see on our annual budget are going to be retirement benefits. Last year, it was voted that our outreach coordinator would go to full time. So that increased by... Um, around $12,000. Our administrative overhead increased um, almost by, a, I wanna say 100%, just under 100%. Um, the reason being is we have received, applied for and received um, $273,993.95 in grant funds for this fiscal year. Um, and that reflects their cost of, um, their increased in their administrative costs to reflect their increased workload. Um, most of our items stayed the same. Our janitorial expense went up because it reflects the accurate number um, from what we were projecting with our other space. We also went up by $1,000 in our vehicle repair slash maintenance. Most of the expenditures this year occurred were for maintaining the vehicle. It's a 2011 Ford Econo van. Um, so we had to replace all the brakes all of the tires and do regular maintenance. Um, so we went up by a thousand dollars. We actually should probably go up more, but I was trying to be a little more fiscally conservative. Um, miscellaneous cost around $3,000 for our program tent and some other things that we use for the summer picnic. Um, we have our program space and administrative office space. Um, the administrative office space went up around 5%, so it went up $45 a month from $1,800 to $45. Sorry, that is my work phone. Um, so that's where most of the expenditures went up there. Uh, pretty much consistently, we've tried to stay within our Budget amount, um, we look at carrying forward around $18,818 for carry forward funds. That is reflective of the outreach grant that we received, which we weren't sure if we were going to get. It became a competitive grant through um, Massachusetts Council on Aging is managing it for the EOEA. So we were able to um, reduce and um, our budget for 2024 by that and carry that forward. Right now, I don't know if we're going to be able to reduce it more. However, with some of the grant funds that we have received, uh, mainly if you look at the page four of the memo that I passed out to everyone this evening, um, the digital literacy grant was for $100,000 and the hybrid programming grant was for just under $120,000. Um, we do have some funds in there for administrative costs, which would reduce the amount of salary for myself and for our outreach coordinator, Chris Goudreau, who is helping to administer and manage the grants with me. 
Um, however, in our hybrid programming grant, we were able to um, add funding for a part-time position, which I am in the process of determining if we're able to utilize that funds. Because if, if you look at our statistical data on page two, um, you'll see that we have increased members um, again, um, pretty pretty high this year. We are increasing program activities um, by 119% for our lowest program uh, days per month. Um, so right now we have around, let's see, we had 391 members attend approximately 1,000 programs for 2023. 122 members received 582 services from our outreach coordinator. Uh, meaning 122 individuals received multiple services from um, from our outreach coordinator. 44 members received 313 rides, but we also had some large events um, where people were able to go on field trips that we had to the Big E, um, to the Springfield Armory Museum, um, and to Look Park mm -hmm. for different activities. So... Um, the highest daily average of individuals attending program per day per month uh, during 2023 was 77 for March. That was an increase of 13% from 2022 for the highest month in um, in 2022. So we went from um, averaging 31 people per day for January through August of 22 to 60 people per day per month from September to December of 2022. And now we're averaging... Um, Seven or 68 per day per month in 2023 was the average. So what the highest month total was 77 in March and the lowest was 57 individuals in the months of May and June. And if you look at the previous statistics, we had a lowest daily average during um, January through November of 2022 for 26 individuals. So we've really increased membership and participation, which has been phenomenal. Um, and during 22, uh, we had 981 events at the Senior Center. That includes um, our monthly lunches with the Rainbow Elders at our Sunderland space. We also have the Foot Clinic. We also have Brown Bag Program, which is those are once a month. Um, and that number is also included in our 1,000 programs um, during 2023. That's the calendar year, not the fiscal year. Um, so we're doing really well. Our new program coordinator who started in January is um, hitting the floor running and we've been able to um, have events on a regular basis. Also with the hybrid programming grant, we um, and the digital literacy grant, we were able to purchase in lottery off 129 iPads. They're ninth generation. We're currently um, offering the first instructional classes for the first groups. We have four cohorts going right now. Um, then we have um, the second grant for the hybrid programming. We will be offering our programs in a hybrid fashion as well. And we have a good amount of funding to pay for programming um, for that for the upcoming year. And that funds has to be spent, I believe March of 25. So we've got a good portion of funding um, through fiscal year 25. Any questions? I can break down the grants, but I think they're self-explanatory on the last page of what we've received funding for. So we're able to offer um, movement classes. We're able to offer um, transportation. That grant expires in June, but we're looking at partnering with the PVTA um, you know, to expand more as well as the FRTA. There's a grant that both RTAs put in for, we're waiting to hear back from, and that could potentially help us join them for one day of service that we provide using our vehicle or using one of theirs. Um, so we're looking at that partnership. Um, but that would be uh, for fiscal 26, I believe, but they had to get stuff in, you know, earlier. Um, we also put in the grant, um, which pertains to our capital request that we made to the finance committee for a new van. The state, uh, through their MassDOT program, pays for 80% of the vehicle. We would pay for 20% with an in-kind cash uh, match. 
And I put a request in through all three towns and the capital request form um, ver shows the data that I had given um, to each of the other towns as well as Deerfield. Um, I apologize, I didn't make an extra copy of that because I wasn't sure if you needed that for tonight. But I just wanted to make you aware that there was a capital request put in for that. What, may I go ahead. Um, what is the amount that you're seeking then? You said in-kind cash contribution. What yes. is that amount? So for, um, it's a combined total of around $27,000 split amongst the three towns. Uh, Deerfield would be asked for the higher amount. If you give me a second, I can pull up that exact figure. No, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's 50% and it's 25 for the other. So let me just put the capital stuff here. So give me one sec. I have 12,500. Thank you. Yes, that is correct. And, and 6250 for the other two towns. And that is for that that's that request is has been submitted now for FY25, correct? Yes. But that'll, um, that'll be a different budget. Yeah, that's not gonna come out of this. This will that's a different budget. Out, that'll come out of capital. It's, it's a, a different budget, it's but it's also funded from free cash. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, it would be maybe. Um I have another question. Yep. Can you um can you explain a little more about the part-time position you mentioned that would be funded from the grant? Um that position is currently active with our program coordinator, what I'm looking to potentially do is make him full time, up to 35 hours a week through funding with that. And then I would make a bigger ask during fiscal year 26, but showing statistical data as to what we've done for programming and why we would need to be able to support that. Um, while I know you weren't here for last year, so we did that in the process. Um, we were able to show because we increased our membership count and the amount of services needed um, and the amount of staffing hours that were really needed. Um, that position originally, the outreach coordinator was originally 12 hours. We bumped it to 15, then 19 for a while. And then we were able to get it up to 35, but we've moved him to 40 because we've been able to subsidize some of that with grant funding. So that's the position you're referring to? Nope, or that was the outreach coordinator. So we would do. We were looking to do the same with the program coordinator. Yeah. Our previous Excellent. program coordinator was limited for personal reasons to 15 hours only. Um, we currently have our program coordinator at 19 hours, which is the amount uh, before being able to fund any benefits. But with the grants that we've been able to acquire and also um, the formula fund, which is not reflected here because it's something that um, isn't voted on. It's a a fund that's provided um, through EOEA at $14 per older adult based on this 2020 census data. Um, Governor Healy just increased it from $12 per older adult to, to 14. So we're looking at around $42,000, a little over 42,000 for that. That's funding all of the outreach coordinator, or excuse me, the program coordinator's position, part of the program coordinator's position, and also some items such as like our internet, our, with our cell phones, because we are in multiple locations. So we got rid of having a landline. We made them all cellular um, based. And then also um, some other minor programming costs are included in that. So how many, uh, what is the FTE for FY25? And it's all going to be funded from the grant, from grant funding, correct? For FY25. For what? For the program coordinator. Program coordinator, <laughs> yes. That is a formula fund uh, position that's fully funded through there. If if it is approved through the select board, personnel board in the proper channels like we did before um, to get that position to go full time, um, we would fund half, we would fund it through another grant. There would be no ask in our operations budget for um for for fiscal 25, we would come back and potentially ask for fiscal 26. But the position will go full-time in FY25? That is my goal. And then it will roll to the budget on FY26? Potentially, depending on how I'm uh, creative with moving with the funding. Um, we've been able to apply for different grants. The outreach, um, the outreach SIG service incentive grant originally had been something that was guaranteed to um, certain communities within the Commonwealth. Unfortunately for fiscal 24, that became a competitive grant. So my ask basically was the same amount of funding that we had continuously received. So we would be within the more um, 
favorable for approval, but it's going to continue to be a competitive grant. But unfortunately, with 9C budget cuts through the governor's uh, budget moving forward, I do not know if that additional SIG grant, service incentive grant funding, will be available for future. Will that cover the, the benefit costs as well? For the, the grants, grants it'll um, cover certain grants, this? yes, but not all grant, but um, potentially yes. I have not had the opportunity to sit down and analyze all of the data. Um, this position, this per new person just started in January. And then with the awarding of the second grant, which I think was in December for the hybrid programming, um, you know, we were just looking at that. And we also have the potential ability, um, Conway is considering joining our interim municipal agreement, but that, that won't happen until they decide to vote at their annual town meeting. So there's a lot of things up in the air. I appreciate all the information and all the work you've done on grants. Thank Congratulations. you. Thank you. So I just want to raise a question. Um, so if you don't have grants and you've brought somebody on full time, what happens when we don't have any money to pay them anymore? That's why it'll be an ask in fiscal 26. And by then you probably would know full costs, insurance, cost of uh, the yes. employee and OPEB. Okay. Yes. That's what I did with the outreach coordinator. Good. So the, I think Margaret asked this, but I'm, I'm just not with you yet. So okay. um, the program coordinator is covered by the formula fund. Yes, fully. And that includes, so that's full-time, including benefits. Right now, he's currently part-time at 19 hours a week. We are looking at potentially bringing it to a full-time position. Right, but that would be covered by the formula grant. That is my intention. If, if it's not fully covered, so basically what I've been doing is taking the outreach coordinator's position and splitting it between the formula fund and the operations budget. We were able to get the SIG grant to, to help... Uh, cut the cost from the operations budget um, for fiscal 24. So that's why you'll see a carry forward fund of the, the $18,000. So potentially I could use that $18,000 um, to help offset future costs and keep rolling it. I've been pretty good at doing that the past couple of years and that's my goal. Okay. But, you know, that's not to say that there might be a larger expense. Um, as the memo also reflects our current our current lease spaces expire at the end of May of this year. We currently have RFP out. Um, so we do not know um, what potential increased, you know, could come at us depending on who replies to the RFP. Okay. While we have the um while we have the cost of what we've been paying to the current two spaces. Um, I cannot guarantee that they will number one respond. Number two, they'll be the ones selected. So okay. I have my I, next question. Yeah, I'm space, staying within my budget. Space, so. space um, I believe, and Casey, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the town of Deerfield is currently going to be moving forward with a feasibility study um, on multiple locations. And, um, you know, the potential for using the congregational space here in Deerfield may arise when Tilton is done with their build. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I'm, I can't see into the future. I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm just speaking as to where we are right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any, um, update on that, the place where you had the open this house? Hours, the, um, so as you look at my memo, um, the town of Deerfield or Sunderland has looked at, um, purchasing that place at 23 Plumtree Road. However, um, there is some consideration or, concern about Sunderland taking on the entire cost themselves um, and not, you know, having any guarantee from the other two towns that they're going to continue to stay with an IMA situation and pay into that. Um, so there's concern there. So I don't think at this point it's going to be on their annual town meeting as they're concerned whether or not they would have uh, full support for it. Okay. From their voters. So, um, so it sounds like it, it may not even be on. There. No. No, okay. there was no guarantee. It was just a potential space. It was, okay. you know, trying to see if people would be interested. 
Um, and, you know, because our cost analysis would probably be no more than $4,500 to $5,000 and not stretching the ask. Um, you know, I was it was recommended to me to not put it forward for a capital request from all three towns because it wasn't sure that, you know, that type of a request would pass. Um, and there's different grants that could be per to purchase or renovate the space, or should I say to renovate it for a community uh, development block grant. However, for like 1.375 million, but it would be, it would need to be under a PNS or um, ownership by an entity before you could apply for the grant. And the grant deadline is March 25th of the, you know, every year. So we're really tight. That wasn't going to happen. So. John has a question. Oh, John, go ahead. Sorry, I had to unmute. I have two questions. Group insurance. I don't I was flipping through a book, so it was maybe it was discussed while I was flipping through. Uh, but group insurance hasn't gone up in your budget. Um, we got I, a oh. new one today that you don't have. Yeah, the group insurance is still the same. Oh, group insurance. Okay, sorry. Currently, at this time, John, our group, our um, employees in our department do not utilize the group insurance at this point in time. What's the fifty one hundred dollars that's down there then? I didn't understand. It was a little what you were wondering why the fifty one hundred is in there. It's more it's more in there for a placeholder, John, in case someone were to take insurance. It certainly wouldn't cover Okay. If somebody were to take a family plan, that's more like twenty thousand dollars to the cost of the town. So that's it's 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 more a placeholder holder just Okay, thank you. Um, and I find it amazing that four of these years you expended exactly what was appropriated. I don't know whether to say good job or how did you do that? Um, actually, so I just started in, or I think I started in case, I don't remember, was it during fiscal 22 or 23? I started during fiscal 23 because I started at the end of January of 22. So um, the 22 budget was already in place when I started. And then fiscal 23 is when I came on board, I think, and that's when the increase occurred. Um, but we were, we've were we been able to carry forward funding um, last fiscal year of actually more than 20,591. We were able to carry forward 26,000. I think by the end of the year, sorry, I'm just looking for my exact numbers in my memo I sent over. Yeah, we carry forward $26,273.89, which was an increase of $62,73.89 from our original $25,591 that we thought. But right now, that um, $5,100 that you mentioned was is included in that $18,818, including the service incentive grant info. So... Um, what what John was really referring to was was that's that's an assessment, John. So it's a town assessment that goes into a special revenue fund, and her operations are handled okay. through the All special right. revenue fund. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Wondering why it was exactly oh. the same each year, what we appropriated and what we spent. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So thank you. Again, what the. I'm going to ask one question because I already halfway through it, and then you can go. Um, can you say again what the what the carry forward? That's a um, what what is that used for? Um, it's used for the budget. So basically, because Brenda just referenced, we're a special revenue fund. So if we have any monies left over, we move it onto the next fiscal year. So we don't put it back in the pot. Right. It's 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 theirs. It stays in the special revenue fund. And so you maintain a cushion of about 20,000. Well, I think the only reason that there's a cushion of that much money is because of the pandemic okay. from before, um, because some of the uh, some of the programs and other things did not occur during that time frame. So that money was kept. That and and now mainly because we didn't budget for the SIG grant because we weren't sure we were going to get it. And we did. So that's yeah. for this one. And so the same thought going to next year would be that if you get the SIG grant, you won't spend it. And if you don't, then that Correct. cushion is there to cover for yes. that. But it, grant. but it, you know, it's a cushion like, like we shared before, there's no guarantee of where we'll be for space. And if some place comes in at a higher amount or other things, that's a cushion to just balance that out. Okay. 
Thanks. Carol, You're sorry, welcome. go ahead. No, I just so I just want to make a comment. Um the this is on OPEB. Every full-time employee on these group things where Deerfield is the lead community, we are taking on the liability of OPEB. And whether it's SCEMS, whether it's the senior center, any of these things. Um so or the sewer sewer fund, you know, um we are not putting aside adequate funding for OPEB. And I, I just wanted you all to remember that I harp on this every year because it it is long, it is, we're kicking the can down the uh, road for millions of dollars that are not funded at the elementary school and Frontier. We own 50% of Frontier and when Frontier isn't adequately setting aside the money. That's also we pick up. So I'm just saying, please keep that in mind ultimately for further discussion this year. Um, a question on that. Um, the intermunicipal agreements, can they be adjusted to start uh, requiring participating municipalities to contribute to OPA? That would be one of my recommendations, but we inadequately fund ourselves, OPEP. So when we require the other municipalities to fund OPEB at a higher rate, we ourselves have to fund it at a higher rate. Um, so that was one of the reasons we haven't been funding it, Margaret, at a higher rate is because there has been no, um, nobody talking about it or no, no willingness to do that. Um. So this kind of ties in with a, a major concern I have, and it's 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 general major concern. It doesn't address the need for staffing, but we do know that personnel costs and the indirects that go with personnel costs can, um, um, attribute um, or, or are attributed to the largest part of our operating budget. Personnel costs make up the most costs. So when we add personnel, whether it's whether it's grant funded for one year. Um, and rolls into the budget or when we, we, we um, uh, create a new position and just put it on the budget, the costs of the town increase exponentially. So we do, every time a position is added to the budget, uh, in particular, we need to account for the, um, the direct personnel costs, the indirects, the OPEB costs and things. And we need to be able to support those because my fear is that it becomes unsustainable at some point. And I am certainly not arguing against a program coordinator in the least or anybody that's been added, but it's really strictly cost. It's a, it's a huge concern. Sustainability is a huge concern. Um, can I just comment on that? Uh -huh. or, or are you doing your thing still? No, Go ahead. You sorry. I'll, I'll um, while I understand that, you know, this is not specifically directed, you know, at me individually for a department, you know, it's overall, but I will tell you that we, the first year that I was here, we increased participation by over 94% at the senior center. And in order to be able to offer the support to a community that's only going to increase with aging, and the goal is to keep people in their homes, um, to age in place, we need the support at our department. And this department, you know, previously hadn't been um, gathering accurate data. And I don't think they had also been offering the level of support that we have come to start to offer at our, you know, now. And if you look back, I mean, just a few years ago, our full budget was $95,000. And your participation was averaging 26 people per program day. We're at 77 um, for our program day. So we have more than doubled that. And in order to continue to garner support, you know, for this, um, it's going to need to be addressed at some point in the future for at least our department to move forward because we cannot maintain this level of oomph or, you know, um, strengths and um, continuation with the programs without additional support. It's just not feasible. Again, I, I don't argue the need whatsoever, um, but it is a point of discussion and maybe, uh, yeah, point for the select board's discussion in those intermunicipal agreements. Uh, we need to be able to cover some of these costs. 
So just just to speak to the OPEB costs, um, the policy that the select board set forth in, what was it, 2017, 2018, I can't remember what the year was, was to figure OPEB costs at 4% of the previous year's insurance costs to the town. So it's very small, but um, every department, well, I shouldn't say every department, every enterprise fund and the senior center would be charged those OPEB costs in the indirect costs. But since they don't have any insurance, anybody taking insurance, they, they're not subject to it. But you'll find in the indirect costs for both um, SCEMS and for the wastewater treatment plant, that's included. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's included, I'm sorry, it, I, it's, uh, go ahead. I like to raise my hand. Go ahead. And that's included in the intermunicipal agreement for the participating towns. I don't know that it is, Casey. I think they're asked to be talked about the Okay, good. Our IMA, yes, for the senior center. They've been working on it. Our board of oversight has been working on it um, for two two or three meetings. And we have another meeting coming up at the end, end of this week. Thank you. Margaret, what we're doing is we're pulling it, we're we're trying to pull it out of the indirect costs um, because indirect costs comes to Deerfield. So what we want to do is pull OPEB and make it a separate line item under indirect costs. It still comes to Deerfield, but the idea is, is it, as Brenda said, it is based on the insurance, 4% of insurance. And so that way we feel like we can have a discussion with the other two towns. Does the policy include a funding source? Uh, we for example, pay, free cash. Well, we pay it from free cash. I think it's the operating budget comes out of. Some... I don't think there's any specification yeah, in that no. policy. It was a pretty simple policy, Doug. Okay. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks. I would also just to add to the OPEB discussion. Um, I I know it's not soon enough, but I think we pay off our retirement in twenty thirty five. 34 somewhere around there so i would expect at that the, point that we would take all of that and shift it to open that's when um when franklin regional retirement system is supposed to be fully fu fully funded yes um we we have talked about that but it's but it's a long way in the future i mean it's 10 years off so mm -hmm. um and meanwhile it's accruing yeah. but um none of which is it's accruing kind of specifically field. directed at you but yeah. it's, it's directed at you you know, at some point, we'll just want to extend the discussion. So uh, just a general comment and, or question. Would it be logical to set up sort of a policy for when people want to add full-time people or part-time people to their payroll, that they they go through a process that actually delineates what are the costs so that when we have these discussions, we've got all the costs in front of us as opposed to, well, our programming is growing. I mean, the DPW could start offering more services and hiring more people if if we don't have any say in controlling it. So that's why I'm leery about putting grant-funded personnel into full-time positions and then having to decide, are we going to keep them? Because uh, it's not fair to the employee. Right. I would absolutely agree, agree with, with some yeah. something that's policy driven. Absolutely. I think that's important. I have a question on that. Mm -hmm. So the outreach coordinator's position is fully funded in the, well, part half in the operations and half in the formula grant. The monies that I've been saving through the SIG grant could go back into the operations budget. Like it has for, or like it's estimated to be into fiscal 25s. So then that other position wouldn't be funded strictly on a grant. Because like you can't really specify grant language because the EOEA funds is called the formula fund grant. And it's specifically um, determined through the EOEA and it's the same dollar amount for the next 10 years. So I think if you're going to look at that, I would change, wouldn't specify it to be grant unless it's like a grant um, that's not for a long duration because the formula fund grant pays for that position, even in the part-time factor. So I just want to throw that out there. We're just talking about policy. Okay.
Any additional questions? Yeah, I can argue both sides of that, right? So so it, what you say makes perfect sense that if you have grant funding, you can fund this person, you can fund them for a year, you can see how it works. And at that point, we can make the decision as a town, um, you included, whether that position is worthwhile for funding for full time and, and whatever. Um, the problem with that is exactly what whoever just said is we get to that one year point and we decide, no, we can't afford this as a town. Then that poor person has put a year of effort into the job and, and isn't able to go forward. But that's sort of a philosophy discussion, not really helpful to right now. Dave, do you have a question or you just, no, okay. Um, the other thing I meant to say before we started is that um, we have a discussion, actually, as soon as we're done talking about this, we're going to go into, when we're looking at balancing the budget this year, um, we are about $300,000 in the hole with no capital on the list at all. So I would expect that we will have a discussion and I imagine we'll approve the budget. That is, don't don't take that as a final approval because we are going to be going through back through all of the budgets and we're saying this to everybody. We're going back through all of the budgets within the next few weeks. Um, so we may come back and revisit this budget again. If we do revisit again, we'll invite you to come and participate in that discussion. Um, but don't like, it's it's an interim approval if it gets approved tonight. I have a question. Yeah. So it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that if Sunderland and Waitley vote to approve it, that you have to approve, or is that only for the frontier? Um, it would be stems. that would be in your IMA, and I would have to read the language in the IMA. I'm not sure. Okay, what that answer is, but um, it's I don't believe it's in the IMA. Yeah, but I I might so. have, be thinking of a different. I don't think we, we yeah we'd have to go back and look. Yeah. That. Okay. I imagine we would. If we were in that position, we'd also be reaching out to Sunderland and Waitley and having the discussion with their finance committees as well. All right. Please, okay. please don't take this as a slight at all. What, what we're saying, this is this is. No, you're saying it to everyone. I totally get everyone. It. Strictly a, a big shortfall. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if, if we add up all of the budget requests mm -hmm. and we add up the maximum we're allowed to tax, and our estimates of all of the other sources of income, and we add all of our free cash to that, we're like three thousand dollars in the three hundred thousand dollars in the hole with no capital, right? That that's our like financial position as a town right now. So it's not like everybody's getting this 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 talk, but it, it it's and that's also including the vote that just occurred to pay for the emergency funding for the roads. That so the passed. emergency funding for the roads, yeah, but we can't use that money for anything else. We can only use that for the roads. Right. Right. I'm just wondering if the budget's in shortfall in addition no. to no. that. Oh, in addition well, to in that, addition. yeah. Yes. Not because yeah. Of, yeah, it has yeah. nothing. No, because not in that. Right. Right. I'm also a resident, so I follow some things, but I resigned yeah. from all of yeah. my committees because this job is a lot more. You're than an amazing job, that. by the way. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you really are. Impressive yeah, between are. the the programs that you have going and the people that you have showing up and the grants that you have gotten. That it's you're it's doing great. an amazing job. It is good. So, very much. You. All right. Any any further questions or discussion? Anybody want to talk about anything internally? No. Okay. So we have a motion and a second for senior center expense account number 541-5420 for $90,299 for the Deerfield portion of that. Any further discussion or questions? No, okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Um, Jim, why don't you start? Jim Cambius, aye. Margaret Nardowitz, aye. Beth Brown, aye. Mark Brennan, I. Julie Chalfin, I. Dave, I. John. John Pereski, I. John Pereski, I. That is unanimous 700. I make a motion uh, for the Senior Center expense 541 uh to support $90,299. And for purposes of select board discussion, I'll second that. 
I just have one question on the carry forward. Does each town have a different carry forward? Is this this a lump sum that's just reported to each town? That's one lump sum split amongst the three towns, or it's just a total of eighteen thousand eight hundred eighteen dollars total. So it's just one lump sum. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just clarify. Yep, and that is for the SIG grant and of the thirteen one thirty five point oh five, and then the fifty one hundred dollars that we expect to carry forward because no one's utilizing the group insurance. Thank you. All those in favor? Tim Hill, G. I. Carolyn S. I. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you do this again next year, if you're able to send it to us in advance, then we could read it before we got here. Last year, I sent <laughs> it way early. I just didn't have the capacity to do it this year. Yep. So I will That's take fine. that under note and try to get it ahead. OK. Too many Thank things. <laughs> Right. Could, could we take care of two votes that should have happened in previous meetings or one that to you review can. before we go to the select board? You bet. Oh, good. Okay. So um, in our first meeting on January 29th, we didn't have the number for the FERCOG assessment. And that account number is 830-5400. It's actually the only thing in your tab eight. And it's for 41,698. All right, do we have a motion? Motion to, uh, motion to fund 41,698 on account 830-5400 for a cause assessment. Second. All right. Discussion. What is, what does this cover, Brenda? Oh. Statutory assessment for the cost services, plus a couple of items that Jenna. are. Oh, done. can't hear you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so that covers the statutory assessment from the COG for regional planning services, but it also covers that one. I think is just statutory. We split the other two. I don't have my budget in front of me, but it. We split out two other things that are elements of support of the COG. Yeah, this is for the regional services and the statutory assessment. That's what I thought. Then there's $100 for something that goes into the Board of Health budget, and then there's an amount that goes into Kevin's budget. But this is this is the one for... Um, so it's gone uh, down two years in a row. <laughs> Um, I'm not arguing against that. That's lovely. No, but it's that's interesting. No, they're actually <laughs> trying to hold the line up their suffers because they're aware that many towns are in um, pretty are hurt. pretty fine, bad financial shape or have struggling with it. So that's been the intent for the past couple of years. Okay, thanks. Their grant, I mean, their operation is partially grant funded. Um, for we, we get a lot of services through the FERCOG, but a large percentage of that is grant funded. And sometimes, you know, it depends on what the grant, if it's funded or not that year. So we get some of it's up and down as far as services, but we there's certainly services provided because Margaret knows that. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. John, you have a question? Did we cover why no statutory assessment? I couldn't hear everything that was spoken. Which... I, the statutory assessment is from legislation in the in the dissolving of the counties, and I, honest to God, can't remember. But it's zero uh, this year, and it wasn't last year. Is that well? Is it, it just it, wrapped it, in? We the didn't whole? get a we didn't get a breakdown. Ah. We just got the full amount. That's all we uh, got. So it's a, so it's included in the forty one six ninety eight probably. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. In the, in the budget sheet, there's it's broken out in that it's around two thousand bucks, and it and it gets. Um, it, it's based on population and okay. it's based, it's, uh, there's something else, but it has to do with the dissolving of the county, John. And I don't understand, it has to do, I think it, if I remember correctly, it has to do with the roads, the county roads. And I think he's just asking why it's not showing up what? in 2025. And that's because right. it's not broken out. It, it's wrapped into that 41,000. Oh, Brenda, yeah. Brenda explained yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm, okay. I'm sorry, John. I misunderstood your question. Got it. it okay. It's around 2000 bucks. All right. Any question? Comments? All right. Uh, let's do a roll call vote. Uh, Jim, why don't you start? Jim Cambia is aye. Margaret Nardowitz aye. Beth Brown aye. Mark Brennan aye. Julie Chalf and I. Dave Sharp aye. John, you're muted. You want to just raise your hand if you're aye? John Pareski aye. Uh, beautiful. All right. That's unanimous. Seven zero zero. Um, I make a motion uh, that the select board support the FERCOG core assessment count 830, uh, 830, 5400 for $41,698. Second. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Carolyn Nessai. So if we could go to the treasure collector expense 145-5410 um, for $36,250. This was previously voted at $39,775 and you had asked Sarah to go back and see if she could get the um, actuarial study split out so that we were paying it equally each year and Parker was more than happy to do so so we've revised her budget accordingly so it just needs to be revoted okay thanks do we have a motion would that only be a match no no 36 in year all right I'll make a motion that we recommend Thanks. uh the amount of thirty six thousand two hundred and fifty four account number one four five dash fifty four ten treasurer collector expense. Second. Any discussion? So is this up or down from the previous from what we voted before? This is down. Yeah. Third, so we just split dollars. this number. It used to be seven thousand fifty. Now it's thirty five twenty five. Okay. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. We can't do that. Um, let's do the roll call vote. James Camby is aye. Margaret Nardo is aye. Beth Brown aye. Mark Brennan aye. Julia Chalf and I. Dave Sharp aye. John Pereski abstains. I don't have the new sheet, so okay. I don't know what, what I'm looking at. Six zero one. So it's a reduction of thirty five hundred three thousand five hundred twenty five dollars. So it's level funded. Mm -hmm. So, so next year we'll see 35. No, no it's just in, instead of having a skip, six. They, they've taken every other year and split it. I make a motion uh, that we approve the treasurer collector expense 145-5410 at $36,250. <laughs> Second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all the way. Tim Hilchi, aye. Carolyn S. I. Okay. Thank you. Everybody. It's 14. It's actually take a minute and talk about this handout. So, this is essentially what I emailed everybody a couple of days ago. Um, it's lying down here if you need a copy. Um, and I emailed it to um, John and Dave. I emailed it to you. Um, let me see if I can. Julie, what do you want to call this document? Okay. Um, budget balance summary. How about okay. that? It's very much, I wrote draft on it because it's very draft. It's still, we haven't approved all the um, um, numbers on it yet, um, but it, it's for, for discussion. Um, Oh, I can't share my screen. Can you let me share my screen? Okay. So, um, 
this is what I was talking about earlier. So first up, um, the numbers in the document that I gave you that's sort of shared here on the screen, um, all of the budget numbers are correct as of right now of the, the dollars that we're talking about right now. We got an updated revenue sheet this does not include whatever was updated on the revenue sheet. It's whatever we had yesterday for revenues. So I think revenues went up slightly. Um, hmm. No? Uh, no, what you were not, I think you plugged in the right number. Oh, I did? Okay. Yeah. Good. All right, then the, the, this might be right. <laughs> it's close if it's not right, and I will correct it before next. I'm, I'm pretty thing. sure you have so, the right number in there. So we've had some discussions, and if you look at the sheet in front of you, the top block on the left is our municipal budget, the omnibus budget. So those are recurring expenses, operational expenses. The top block on the right is our revenue that is essentially recurring revenue. So it's our property taxes, state funds, and local receipts, um, and, and it's recurring stuff. The next block down, or the next two blocks down, um, are on the left-hand side are budget items that are we've deemed as non-recurring, um, and mm -hmm. um, they are things that we can pay for using one-time funds like free cash. So if you slide over to the right, you see that there, um, what we used last year was free cash and then capital stabilization. And we had some funds left over from sales of real estate that were available. So those are sort of one-time funds that we can use for one-time expenses. And so we use those typically for capital. Um, and then I ex pulled out down at the bottom is the debt excluded stuff. Um, so that's not included up at the top. So we are not supposed to use one-time funds for recurring operational expenses. So if you look at last year, which is, um, I don't know, can you guys see where I am with the, so we're in the top right-hand block, it says revenue detail. So the first two columns are FY24, so the FY24, that was what we thought at town meeting that we would have for revenues at 16,762,219. See this number right here, right? Our expenses were 16 million. These are our recurring expenses, 16,814,377. So we used $52,000 essentially of free cash for our recurring expenses, which we are not supposed to do. So if you remember last week or the week before, whenever we were talking about, we were talking about that police cruiser. That police cruiser, in my opinion, is a non-recurring, it's a capital item and it shouldn't be in this recurring expense. So if we had pulled that out, we wouldn't, that it's essentially 55,000 last year, then we would have been okay. We would have not used our free cash for operating expenses. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Everybody's with me on that? Um, so if we look at this year, where we are right now with the budgets that have been requested, we have 17,400,000 of requests of, of um, revenue, planned uh, expected revenue. We have $17,700,000 of requests. So we're, we're, 300, we're looking at $330,000 of free cash spent on operating expenses, right? Which is really, not kosher. Um, if we scroll down then, um, if we look at our estimates for SCEMS, Smithvoke, Snow and Ice, OPEB, um, and we I think we have a number for Frontier Capital. Um, that's an, another 889,000 that we're looking at. Um, and we have um, free cash available to cover that, but go ahead. Why is skims not recurring? Just it, because it is, in my opinion, it, it should be, it absolutely should be. Skim should be recurring, Smith Vogue should be recurring. We always have at least one, as far as long as I've known, we've always had at least one kid at Smith Vogue. 
Um, we really, never put it really is. If, if I recall, we discussed this last year, and the conclusion was it would be too hard. To well, get we, would, it we would not be able to. I mean, we can't. We don't have enough money for it. We That's don't it. have enough money yeah. for it. We, we really should, but, but yeah. That, that's it, why you have a proposition two and a half override at some point, because what you would do would do a structural change. Yeah, put it on you the would put it in the operational budget and you would do a one time fix. The problem is I don't support an override because we don't other than moving scams. Um, we I mean, I haven't seen anybody making a willing willingness to do any other structural changes. So I, I don't feel like uh, we have enough so, of an argument to go forward on um, a proposition two and a half override, truthfully. I mean- So what do you mean by structural changes that we're not willing to make? A propositional two, a two and a half override is for one time right. fix. Yep. And just because you're running over your budgets every year doesn't mean that that's what, a reason to go to a proposition two and a half override. In my mind, it, it's not a structural okay. change. It's just you're not living within your budget. And that's why I haven't supported doing anything. But I feel like I'm arguing the wrong side of this because but, I'm not really a big, big fan but, of doing the override. But if you look at the way the budget is structured, um, if we only increase by two and a half percent, so we talked earlier about personnel costs. Personnel costs increase more than two and a half percent per year. So over time, the personnel cost grows and eats away at your ability to do anything else. So right now, in my opinion, we do not do the maintenance that we should be doing. I agree. But and that, we are not putting money aside. But that's a one-time fix. You could say, we're going to put fund and maintenance um, line item, and, and then that would be an argument for a structural change because we don't have... The other funding. thing that I don't think we're doing very well yet, although I haven't I haven't seen the capital yet for this year, but we're supposed to have a five-year capital plan and look out. And, and in my opinion, and this is totally on me because I started this and haven't done it, I would like to see a 20-year capital plan. And I would like to see that with major items on it, new roof, whatever, big, big major things so that you can see it coming. Um and if we had a five-year capital plan and we had a 20-year capital plan, then we could do things like capital stabilization. I mean, uh, yeah, capital stabilization, which we're not doing. Right. And I and I agree with that because I've been on the capital committee since the very beginning. And I feel that um, whenever I take the, just like I, I, a couple months ago, I took a updating webinar and I think we are on top of stuff very well, except our capital plan. Our capital plan yes. is too wishy-washy and it's not, um, I mean, to me, that's where that we have to work on. So I agree with you hundred percent on that, but I would like to argue back to you as Brenda knows, we are extremely conservative on our um, formulas for generating revenue. And the reason why I have argued against changing those extremely conservative formulas is because we generate free cash every year. And, and so in my mind, um, it's, it's good. It's yes. What you're saying is true, but the way we have set up um, our free cash is that we do have the ability to have some operating ca um, costs come out of free cash every year because we have not changed the formula. And the reason why, again, I argue that is over a 20 year period when we've had um, the fiscal problems of 2008. Um, we had um, 5C cuts um, in 2005. And then we had, of course, COVID in 2020. We were able to um, weather all those terrible ups and downs in revenue because we we were very so conservative on our formulas, and that's why which um, is standard advice. I mean, that's the yes. fiscal advice that you get from municipal budgeting that you should be right. you should be um, conservative in those right. estimates. But we are we have been so extremely conservative that it does generate operational costs, and that's one of the reasons skims started out coming out of free cash. Has anyone? Have, has anyone been through a prop to a national 
overriding another community. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that what a Prop Two and a Half override does, as opposed to a, a debt exclusion I mean, or a capital yeah. exclusion. Yeah. So a Prop Two and a Half override actually overrides the tax levy permanently. So right. it sets a new base essentially right. that will grow. Right. That will grow mm -hmm. two and a half percent every year. It's not a not a you know it's not a one time deal. It just sets a new base. Right. So, I, I my my thought is if you don't have an override large enough to cover the shortfalls you have, and I'm not just talking scams. I mean, I, to me, scams is an is an operating expense. It, it just it happens to Absolutely. not be in the omnibus budget. But if you don't have an override pass that will cover your entire shortfall and then some projected budget growth after that, right? The override's going to be, it, it's going to be without purpose. Yeah. You know, a year, two years down the road, even. Yeah. So it's a regular it's, um, thing. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to uh, look at an override right now. Yep. Yeah. It wouldn't definitely need some sort of really solid. Um, study that says capital scams, all these things, and but normal budget shortfalls to set a set a base high enough that two and a half percent going forward is going to keep us yeah on an even keel. So we did an override in 1996, I think. Um, I was looking in the it's in the deal, or at least that's what the DLS records show oh. is that we won passed in 1996. So um, Prop Two and a Half started in 1980, essentially. So 16 years into it, we did a Prop Two and a Half, I, I don't and so her, another. I don't remember that? Do you? No, I wasn't here. I know, but I meant any. <laughs> no, I got one. No, no, no. But I meant I don't remember what was the argument though. Do you? Yeah, or how much it was. Yeah, I'm I interested no to find out. I don't yeah. know. I just saw that. I don't remember the argument that said that there was a vote. It's just so. a, just another tip. A DLS has everything on their website, mm -hmm. so they do have a very thorough explanation of free cash and how it should be used. And it's and I'm just going to read one little piece here. As a non-recurring revenue source, this is how DLS looks at it. Uh, free cash should be restricted to paying one-time expenditures, funding capital projects, or replenishing other reserves. If a community incorporates free cash into revenue source projections for next year operational expenses, it is prudent to place a percentage restriction on the total free cash to be used. Free cash, or I'm going to call it operating expenses for lack of a better term, last year free cash um, in the amount of 45% was used to fund uh, things that might be considered um, recur recurring or operating. Um, so there's a significant amount of free cash uh, being spent for, for recurring expenses. I agree. And it also, um, it hits you in your your um, bond rating, right? It Isn't does. It, that's one of the things they look at in your bond rating if it you're is. using free cash to cover your... Probably. Um, it does. So... I don't know. So I, I don't know that there's any conclusion to be drawn from this, but it's just something to keep in your mind as we go through that um, this is the position that we are in at the moment. And when we're done going through all of this, we're going to have to figure out what to do about it. Anybody have any questions or discussions on this mess? I appreciate this midpoint discussion. Go ahead, John. When do we expect we'll be at a point where we have to nail down what we want to do? I, I mean, think we need the capital numbers. We don't have those yet. When do they expect to get those? I don't, I don't know. Soon. We're going to try and meet this week to get all this stuff started. So some of the capital requests came in to Casey late. So, um, yeah, hopefully within a, a couple of weeks, we'll have a capital plan. Should there also be a discussion on the um, emergency road repairs as well, since funding sources will be used, various funding sources will be used for that? At some at some point, that, we'll, yeah. we'll hopefully have um, the emergency repairs um, done, I don't want to say, hopefully before April 1st. Um, that doesn't mean all, the road damages are done. It's just that everything is stabilized and all our emergency repairs um, are will have been completed. We're starting Hawks Road 
um, right now, today, it was the first day at Hawks Road. Um, I anticipate we'll be able to work tomorrow, but we're supposed to get Tuesday night into Wednesday. We're supposed to get two or three inches of rain and, you know, big winds, which hopefully will not do anything to the steeple on the 1821 building. But, oh, oh, no. Um, no. you know, so hopefully um, we can be back out to work on Thursday and Friday. But, um, you know, if there's more damage on Wednesday up there, then, you know, we're I was just I was just thinking if free cash needs to be used as a revenue source to fund those emergency road, it needs if it needs I, to be I one of the sources. No, no, we're not counting. Okay, okay. Um, we're not counting. We'll probably that. use I, I would hope that we would use general stabilization and the grant that we got from the state and that should be able to cover the whole thing right. I would expect. And we will discuss that. Did did everybody get a copy of this? Or is this did you just give me this, Casey? Or... Yeah, we got, just it. got it. Okay. So this is the draft warrant articles. We're not going to talk about oh. it now, but you've got a copy there. Um select board meets this Wednesday to sort of finalize this and close the warrant. Um, but when we go through it's a long-winded answer, but when we go through all the warrant articles, there are articles in here that address the rescinding of the funding and the use of general stabilization. And at that point, when we talk about those, we'll talk about the, the funding for the road. The, the, the timeline, I believe, is um, there's $5 million still to be um, distributed towards storm damage. We know anecdotally um, that probably $3 million of that is going to go to to Lemonster. Um, Lemonster is appealing its um, non-federal uh, declaration. Um, the appeal, it, it's pretty sure that it will be turned down. So hopefully that will occur in the next month, within the month, so that we will know if we get additional distribution on, on that $5 million. We've been in contact with uh, Joe Comerford's office and continually putting our emergency expenses um, and updating them and updating MEMA and updating A&F on um, our expenses, ongoing expenses, just to stabilize our roads. So hopefully that's why we're rushing to finish up is so we'll have a final number to forward to them and hopefully we'll have a distribution of some amount. But I mean, it would be lovely to say we're going to get another half a million or 750000 but it could be 50000 I mean, we it's no different general, than before. If we spent stabilization in order to fund a portion of that emergency road work and a check happens to be cut for uh, for Deerfield um, at some point late in the fiscal year or even early next fiscal year, we could put it back in general stabilization as long as, and probably should put it back in general stabilization to replenish it as long as um, there are no restrictions on that money, right? Right. Uh, that well, the intention, I, uh, the money that we did get was in the supplemental budget of fiscal 23. It is my intention that there will be a request from us of whatever amount the difference is between now and, you know, the end of the fiscal year, um, a request for us to have out of fiscal 24 supplemental budget the amount difference that they that we've expended so we didn't see that money from fiscal 23 until you know uh in january so yes we'll be in the next fiscal year but then that money would probably we would just you know sit in our bank account which hopefully we would get and then we would at the special town meeting in the fall we would you know put it back in the to the um stabilization but so there's several opportunities for continued requests, which we are pursuing, you know, on a regular basis. <laughs> so the way I'd plan to address all of this is to, over the next few weeks, get through all of the budgets line and by line item so we have a solid understanding of that, then talk about capital, then look at the total amount that we have, because by then we'll have everything. And then we'll start saying, oh my goodness, what do we do now? And um, have that discussion. And then once we've had that discussion and go back and revisit um, some of the line items, then we'll get into the warrant articles and go through and read and, and vote all the warrant articles. Sort of the schedule. Alrighty. 
Um, All right. I think we're ready for more budgets. Okay. So we left off last week. Um, the next budget to look at would be contracted services at 159-5410 for 269,614 dollars. Great. We have a motion. I move that we recommend the sum of $269,614 for contract services, account number 159-5410. And a second. Second. Which one of you seconded that one? That's <laughs> all right. Bless you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're seeing here and the select board had a long discussion about this um, what you're seeing here uh, is anticipated changes that we think are going to be in, ahead of us for many of the functional operational costs for us to provide services and these are things like our computer maintenance, our consultants, copier rental, telecommunications costs, um, peg access, which is the funding we get through Comcast for our public access TV um, group. And there's several things that have increased, but we made some adjustments last week with the select board. So, there is an outlier up here, and that's at the top of our request. It's $36,000 for computer maintenance. Um, that's network, email, those sorts of items. Um, this, there may be a change to this a little bit later. We're just working through numbers. I just got numbers today. And that's to change how our email is structured to get a government account through Microsoft Office. Um, we weren't, we actually didn't know until today whether we could do that or not. So that's going to be an adjustment that I have not had a chance to talk with our IT guys about yet. So this is pretty much, I, it may go up. I'm not positive. Um, copy or rental is pretty straight, is pretty straightforward. We have a five year contract. Um, consultants, we have generally seven grand or so that we put toward consultants for various, for general. And then we have Grant and MVP Consulting for $10,000. Um, we do have file server. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the Siemens contract, which is an ongoing contract that we pay maintenance on. Um, what is that for? It's, help me with this one. It's a 20-year contract. Oh, uh, it's It was Some the sort of early green thing, right? communities thing know, that right? we were, uh, yeah. Um, and that increases by what? 5% a year, I think. That's 5% a year, right? I, I don't know. I just go by this schedule the schedule that they have is, in the, in yeah. the contract. Many moons ago. Um, so the next thing you'll see is this King service file organization thing. We've reduced it. It's honestly a pretty heavy lift for us. There's some departments that need it to work. So we've, we've got some allocation left in there, uh, but we did reduce it mindful of the fact that this budget's increased significantly. Um, we made an adjustment since you last saw this to keep our training costs level funded. And the reason we think we're going to be able to do that is because we now have an opportunity to utilize a service through the Franklin Regional Council of Governments for free, and it's for HR support. It also, they also have training modules that we could share with staff. So we're hopeful that that will get us to the finish line of a little bit more training without it being a huge cost to us. Um, so that's, Brenda and I had that conversation, decided to leave it level funded since we have that opportunity. Um, we also needed to increase our landfill solar services contract with Beth Greenblatt at Beacon Integrated S Systems, I think. Yes. Um, 
we are now back into the negotiation phase for the lease agreement for landfill solar now that the interconnection has gone through with Nexamp and Eversource. So they have an interconnect agreement. They're ready to move ahead. They have asked for some adjustments in the pilot agreement, but the pilot agreement is tied directly to the lease agreement. So we think based on our past experience that we're gonna need a little bit more money next year. Um, we had reduced it significantly while we were waiting to see what was gonna happen between Nexamp and Eversource. Um, and I've had a conversation with Beth Greenblatt and we're gonna try to keep it as, as low as possible, but we have to do the right research and, and put the town in a good position for both those agreements. Um, broadband, we had a slight decrease thanks to the administrative assistant, Pat Kroll in our office. She did some good negotiation with Comcast. So we're in good shape there. However, um, we do have our a slight increase in our website hosting and we're going to take a look at that long term. I think we're in the last year of our contract, but don't quote me. So I have to go back and look at that. Um, our rave system has gone up slightly, but that's a year over year increase that we see on a regular basis. Um, the biggest thing you'll see in this portion, the telecom portion, is the $7,300 for telecom, new telecom system. This is a subscription service that we would utilize because our phone systems date from 2008 and they're dying. And it's cheaper to go through a subscription service and have access to a voice over internet protocol system that comes with the phones. We pay, we would pay for it on a monthly basis. And this cost, this $7,300 would include the initial installation to get us up and running after July 1st. So Casey, what are the, what will the recurring annual expenses be after this one time, after this first year? After this first year, uh, oh, she, I'm sorry, I should have brought that with me. Can we go back to that, Margaret? Because sure, I no think problem. I can grab you the number. I just need to look at my email real quick. Um, and then we have our Zoom accounts and we utilize them on a regular basis. We have a very active group of committees. So those Zoom accounts we need, and they're for two with a certain allowance for the number of people at meetings. Um, and that's actually something that I give a lot of credit to the staff. They moderate these meetings to help the committees make sure they can do their business. And it's not something you see come across on a spreadsheet, but it's a lot of work that goes into it. So we appreciate that we, fact. We also use private. We do. And there's actually one person who has a pri two people that have private accounts that donate their accounts when necessary, when we we have too many meetings all in one day. Do you have any committees that have the tech savvy to be able to run their own Zoom meetings? Um, We've talked about that. Senior housing does that. Yeah. Senior housing does. Yeah. That, that would... That would save staff. That saves staff at least from that. Oh, from doing that. CCI and and oh, uh, and uh, senior housing. I forgot about it. We use Lily's. We use we use Lily Dwight's. She runs that. Okay, thanks. So that's that section, and I will come back to your question, Margaret. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, then we have our annual software for accounting and other our other financial software. And that also goes up in, on, in increments. Um, you do see a negative of 5250, which gets billed out to, uh, it's sewer utility building, billing. It gets billed out to the uh, sewer wastewater treatment fund and a price fund to offset that. Um, our maps and assessors, other assessor hostings are here. They go up on a, a fairly routine basis. In one case, the general code only has $1,000 in there. We keep that in case we need to make adjustments, but a lot of our general code adjustments happen in the town clerk's budget. I was going to say general code charges us $1,000 every fee, year that right? goes directly into this budget. Rate. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then you also have these other mapping adjust hosting services and that's for our online maps i believe right the increase that you see for weights and measures that's a contract with the state and we were paying about forty five hundred dollars for years and then they 
asked us to sign a contract and they increased the costs to what you see here. Um, would you unpack what that actually is? What? Weights and measures. Weights and measures is the inspection services that we get for services from the state to do that work because otherwise we would have to pay an employee or a consultant provide all the weights and measures Inspection you know, like this, like at a gasoline station. Okay. Gas station. Yes. Um, with a scale. Yeah. Okay. Um, True core. Yeah. Any, any, scale. anything like that that um, that have to come out and verify that is ac accurate. <laughs> this is the most expeditious way to do this. Joe. This is the cheapest. She's trying to say. Otherwise, you have to pay for it. That's the cheapest. And then the last piece of this section of request is the $80,000 for peg access. And so we get, Comcast gives us a certain amount, certain amount of money. We then give that to FCAT to run our public access TV. Mm -hmm. And if yeah, you give the, me... re the revenues are in our local receipts. Thank you. Um, also, it's the service from the state is only available for small towns um, because they are recognized that people can't, you know, small towns can't afford a full-time employee to check, oh, you know, on a regular this basis. Discussed through FERCOG, doing anything regionally as opposed to the state. I, I don't know how much the other the other rural towns in this area are paying, but it makes me wonder whether or not we could afford the sal the salary of a of a sealer of weights and measures if towns regionalized. There's not many towns that would actually be able to regionalize that because you have to be 5,000 or more. Otherwise, the state comes out and does oh, Okay, so you have to be 5,000 or more, not 5,000, not less than 5,000. Less than 5,000, you don't have to pay okay. for it. The state okay. does it. Because we're just we're over, just over 5,000, so it. we have to pay for it. This was actually, at the time we began working with labor stand or is that labor standards? I can't what? remember. The, the yeah. state. The time we started working with them, that was the cheapest option we could find. Yes, um, right. It actually hasn't come up in any of the town administrator for COG meetings, but there aren't a lot of us right. that need the service. Okay. That's that's my only just wondering if there's any it's opportunity with larger towns too, Greenfield, Amherst, Northampton, if, if there could be any kind of cost sharing there. I, I Too late now. <laughs> right now, maybe Stay not. <laughs> um, it would really have to be cost effective versus this. I mean, this is the first increase we've seen in years, right, Brenda? Yeah. Well, I mean, you see it was at 4500 for years. Last year it went up to 4800, this year it's going to 7900. I just a huge jump. I don't why, I don't know. It could have reflected inflation on the part of the state because it's really it's not one person per se, it's a percentage of that person's mm. time who's actually cited out here in mm. Western Mass. So I'm sorry, Margaret, I no, don't, don't have a better answer right now, that's but that's sort of the, the structure we have right now. Um, it's on the cost of being 505,000 people. 19. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So we just have to get 20 people. John, you have a question? Your hands up. Fair, yes. Um, is any well it, how much of this should be chargeable to the sewer department and to skims because i don't see the credit on there for that i see the credit for the sewer billing but nothing else that's it's, right because that's all there is it's a utility but, utility billing module there's no separate module for anything for any other yeah other but all the all the stuff we're doing they're getting the benefit of. So that's why they're included in our indirect costs. So the it's contract an, it, services budget is is in that calculation. Okay, thank yeah. you. So there was last year a line item for permitting software annual fee for six thousand dollars. That's not here this year. Um, uh, where's that? Happened oh, there? it's it's. You see it. Permitting software annual fee. She's right. She's right. I'm not saying we should include. No, it. no, no. It, we <laughs> have to, but you're right, and we missed it. I'm so sorry, we missed it. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's for permitize. That's for permitize. Six thousand. Is that the amount? I think so. We have to go back and look. Um, 
Oh gosh. There was like a capital component to it and then there was the yes. reoccurring fees. So we purchased the modules through our budgets. And last year we had put it in and this year we forgot. Because it's just getting, it's, it's, they're testing the modules out now. So we haven't got, we're not live yet. They're we testing. Go with? Uh, Permitize. Oh, okay. Which is, I think there's quite a few communities that use it, but it runs the gamut mm -hmm. of different types of software. Can be very but this really becomes a cloud-based online permitting system. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's intended to help us find some efficiencies. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, did we already sign the contract for the, the phone system? We have not. We have the quote. We have a quote. Okay. Yep. And we did some research to see whether we could find, what we could find for, um, reasonable costs that we weren't going to end up having issues with certain vendors. Cause there are vendors people have had issues with. Yeah. Do you have some ideas Mark? Well, um, I, I've, Brett Normando is really good. I've, I've worked with That's where our quotes from. Yeah. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think you mentioned at one point, maybe switching email to Office 365. Mm -hmm. um, you can get unified communication systems with Office 365, and um, we might be able to get a discount doing that. I don't know if you're going through TechSoup or who you're purchasing that from, but we might be able to replace our phone system with um, Teams phones. You can we get it. Have to, we'd have to buy all the new units, though. So. Yeah, it may come out to be cheaper than the what what the line item is here. What's this? Seven three hundred. Yes, I think it's going to be. I was just calculating. I went back and looked at my quote. Um, it looks like the first year we would see sixty six hundred for our, about sixty six hundred uh, per year for the cost of the subscription cost of the phones. Yeah. So. But that also comes with free service, and that's one of the issues, is we don't have the capacity to really dig into tax support for that. Yeah. Well, um, shoot me an email. Just a, I'll just a thought. It. Yeah. Because usually, like, it, you know, if, if you're getting a, a particular enterprise plan, I, I don't, it's been a little while since I've done this for phones, but if you're looking at like E3 for E1 or E3, I think you bump up, you know, to either E3 or E5, respectively with Microsoft and then mm -hmm. that allows you to get the whole phone system component and you might be able to save some there. Okay. Send me an email. Will do, yeah. Thank you. All right. What did I miss? John, you have a question? Yeah, I have another question. Can we, I'd like to review the calculation of the indirect costs i feel as i don't know about the other members of the committee but i feel as a member of the committee that we should know how that's being calculated um i wouldn't want a taxpayer to come up and ask me if i've looked at it and i said no so is that something we can look at i'd be happy to share that with you okay thank you get all the time we make adjustments as we find it. And, and and I actually want to pull out OPEB as a separate line item because it looks like the indirect costs, you know, it's based on the number of insurance. OPEB is a separate line item. No, in the... In our indirect costs? Yeah, it's already... Been. Right. It's but... calculated on, on the insurance that each of those right, entities but, has, but has total, occurred. It goes as a total to Sunderland and Waitley, and I would like it to be pulled out so they understand them it's okay. it's been separate on the skims budget for a while if, if you look at it yeah no i saw that but yeah. what happens is when you look on the next page it, it is included in the direct indirect cost so that there is it is part of the indirect cost but it's it is a separate item yep we just need to, maybe we just need to fix the budget sheets or whatever anyway I just want to make sure that there's no issue. So Since we can just add that to a future meeting and can tell Charlotte sure. about it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Should we table this? Uh, oh, then, since we are need you, to, we need yeah, to are you guys? Yeah, we need to fix that one line item. So yeah. The permitting software and yeah. Yep. I agree. 
Okay. Um, that makes do you want a motion? We either have yeah. to withdraw the motion or they make a motion to table or something. Yeah. Well, we're going to take it up again. So I think table. Yeah. Right. So we, we have to make a, we a move to, to table. Right? Um, I move to table this. Uh, our, um, uh, I'm sorry. 269 614, um, account number 159 5410 for a future meeting. Second. Any discussion? We'll call vote. James Candy is aye to table the motion. I have Margaret Nardowitz, aye. Mark Brennan, aye. Julie Chalfin, aye. Dave Sharp, aye. John Pereski, aye. All right, that passes 600 unanimous. So we will revisit this at some future date. Yes. I will try to get that as quickly as I can. Okay, so the next budget is town office expense. It's 192 5430. For 17,000. We have a motion. I'll make a motion I'm to uh, town office expense uh, in the amount of 17,000 for account number 192 5430. Second. Okay. Should we vote this one, Casey? Discussion? Did we vote this one? Okay. Um, I think that the biggest change here is the cost of supplies has gone up and publishing costs are certainly have been much higher than what we've been budgeting. Um, so those two numbers have gone up. What are what are we publishing beyond the annual town reports? We publish this account pays for publishing of certain notices. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you're paper publishing. Yeah. Correct. Correct. We gotta be printing. Uh, yeah. Correct. No, okay. It's, it's not Got it. publishing. Fees. So it's it's like legal notices. Legal okay. Notices. Dog yeah. dog hearings. Um, any kind of hearing. <laughs> and sometimes twice on certain hearings. Yes, there have been times that we've had to do that. So. It, we do the best we can, but it, we're really subject to the statute. Yeah. And what happens? Any more discussion? Nope. All right. Roll call vote. James Camby is aye. Margaret Nardowitz aye. Mark Brennan aye. Julie Chalfin aye. Dave Sharp aye. John Pereski aye. That passes six zero zero. Next. All right. The next one is 196 5400, and that is general insurance. We have a motion. Make a motion to recommend general insurance account number 196 in the you amount of 78,000. I'll second that for discussion. Safety. All right. Oh, I see. Discussion. Brenda? Um, we have overspent insurance already this year by, I think, $5,000. And um, we did just buy, uh, or we're in the process of buying another building. Um, so thus the increase to 78,000. I don't know, Casey, if, if, if the select board, if you wanna talk to that anymore, but that's my understanding. It's uh, general insurance is up just because of um, the worldwide losses. You know, um, Maya has been really, really good about um, trying to keep the stable, but they had a lot of experience this year with, I'm on the Maya advisory committee and um, they had a lot of frozen pipes from last winter. And so the general insurance is 10% up just in general. But we also have um, more insurance value. And um, like Brenda says, we're anticipating picking up St. James Church and the um, uh, house, you know, the parsonage next door. And so this was just an estimate of what it might be increased between the general increase and then more additional insurance. And this is, we just get billed this and pay it and there's no so discussion. There's a, well, there's that, a, that's not true. We, the select board, um, when we go to the Maya meetings and um, I mean the MMA, we always go and get credits and 
I mean, we we get this yeah. maximum they've, discretion. They've proven themselves to be the best choice yeah. for a long time. Um, we go out to bid every couple of years. We do get dividends or credits, uh, participation credits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we did have to wait two years to get a check for those credits, but we did finally get that this month. So we're very happy. It was about $8,000. So, um, so that's great. We do everything we can. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I because I'm on the advisory board. I try to keep current on everything that we can do um, to keep our insurance costs as low as possible. Maya is a Maya is an excellent and well used um, insurance provider in the municipal world. Um, so, um, question: the town pays your premium upfront to get the discount. You, yes. You do oh the, yes. Right. The start of the fiscal year. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Do you, um, I know that it's kind of a catch 22. Um, you explained at a prior meeting that you were over, you've been overdrawn on the, on the insurance line, which isn't ideal for the town because you're waiting for re rewards and credits Correct. to come in. Is there a way without waiting a full year cycle that you would be able to apply existing credits and rewards to your beginning of the fiscal year premium payment? So in other words, offset your premium payment right up front and not have to wait. Sometimes sometimes that happens, but the credits have to be applicable to the correct year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so when that's available and possible to do, we do do that. Yeah. Do you expect that this amount, uh, you know, it's it would be best not, I mean, obviously best not to overspend paying your premium, but do you expect that this amount will cover the full cost of the premium uh, next year, including the new building? As close as we can tell. Okay. Yeah. And you've gotten your quote and everything and right. For the they've, give, they've given you the, the quote for FY25. Oh, they haven't yet. No, they usually don't send that out till like April 1st. So this number is in, is also in flux. Okay. Yep. okay. If, if this is a Margaret, it's the best guesstimate based on, you know, all, all, all the input mm -hmm. and, and, and the increase that, you know, I heard about from the advisory board. Does the capital planning committee have a copy of the, um, the vehicle schedule, building schedule, uh, facility schedule? Do you have all of that for reference? So we have the DP or like the highway department mm -hmm. schedule and, um, some stuff for the schools, but that's pretty much all that the department heads have submitted. Okay. All right. That's something that Maya would provide. I think it's just a, a good resource um, for, for the capital planning committee. If you ever, it should be. Yeah. When you say the schedule, what's the schedule? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's the listing and um, depreciated. I think it's depreciated values. Is it depreciated values? I think it, I think it is. I'm trying to remember it. Um, it's a listing of all the equipment that's covered by the town's yeah. insurer or all, 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 um, all the buildings. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have that gets reviewed we have yearly. The, that's, we update that every year. Yeah. yeah. So it's, we have the list that the auditors give us of all the equipment and stuff. Is that correlated with it? The fixed asset inventory. Okay. When we fill out the application, Margaret, every year we we update it. Yeah, that's good. Any discussion on this side? Any further discussion? All right, we'll call vote. James Camby is aye. Margaret Nardowitz aye. Mark Brennan aye. Julia Chalf and I. Dave Sharp aye. John Pereski aye. All right, that passes six zero zero. Um, it dawned on me during that discussion that we passed over select boards and staff salaries last week, and we now have those. Do you want to move back to that, or would you rather yep. keep plowing forward? Okay, so select board uh, staff salaries is one twenty two dash five one one zero. The motion. I move to recommend 
$381,066 for account number 122-5110, select board staff salaries. We have a second. Yeah, go ahead. Second. Okay. Discussion? Um, a lot of salary. So is this all per the contract and the, um, what you call it, class, class comp, comp plan? Thank you. Class comp. So, um, Casey has a contract. Yes, um, there is one individual in here that was given more than a step raise, um, but uh, our planner was hired at at the um, um, at a. F step seven going up to an F step eight. Um, the administrative assistant doesn't go up because um, that person is already at a step 12, but they did get the 2% COLA because of that. And then there's the part-time admin support um, for doing minutes, things like that, um, that has been in here for the last couple of years. So the person who got more than a step, was there a discussion behind that? Yes. And the reason why is the um, additional workload um, that the person has been carrying. Which uh, which position? I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't show steps here. Which Assistant I, I town administrator. Okay, thank you. Um, what's the date of hire for the... Planner, Economic Development Coordinator. 12-4-2022. So, okay. And so 73000 the $73,000 number reflected only a partial year. Uh, it actually reflected um, a lower pay grade than what he was hired at. Yeah. It was step seven originally, I think, right? Okay. 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 So it was supposed to be a full year. He didn't do the full year, so he didn't actually pay seventy three thousand. Correct. There was yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Another consideration was that we ended up having to negotiate to fill the position, and he had a, a lot of qualifications that weren't. I mean, for good reason or ill, um, the personnel department helped to decide what the entry level should be, and. It didn't fit his abilities and experience. Um, so we made the decision that uh, we wanted him, and uh, and we had that almost half year of salary that hadn't been paid. So we knew we'd take a hit in this year, but even still, you know, going forward, you can't count one year against the next. But in any case. Some of these positions are responsible for grant writing. And we do expect to receive monies for the town through grant awards um, right. in return. Mm -hmm. And in to address the town assistant town administrator position, um, Chris Nolan did a lot of work on the Leary lot and including the EV charging grant, uh, you know, $2.4 million grant, um, which will allow us essentially to spend no town money on on the project if and when we can get a contract from the federal government but uh, yeah. so i think you know it's a good thing and, and casey had a big role in that as well so uh, but it's well worth in my estimation the step increase that is off schedule uh, refresh my memory wasn't the um uh, the economic the ED coordinator planner wasn't that partly intended to offset the um, contract service for grant consulting? Yes. Yes, it's not yeah, it's but there's still some particular types of consulting the board wants to see in the contracted services. We we still have like the MVP um, coordinator that is um, would be is under contracted services. Oh. A municipal vulnerability preparedness grant program that we participate in um, that brings in it well it varies but it's several hundred thousand dollars on a on an annual basis for climate uh, resilience stuff. 
And going forward, I'm not averse to looking at, you know, whether that continues to make sense in terms of can the planner take over the role of doing some of that work or, or maybe not. It's just unknown at the moment since the planner's only been here for three months. And, and, and there is a process that they have to go through. You have to get certified through the state. So even if we wanted to, to take on that um, or have Chris done take that on, um, he'd have to get certified. And that is a process to go through in the state. Does the clock have anybody certified there that could help towns or are they out straight? As um, the reason why we have our own um, grant, you know, grant person is because the FERCOG um, was so stretched that they were not giving us any time at all. So it was easier to have um, work through a separate person than the FERCOG and the FERCOG charges too. So it's not, it wasn't like part of their service. It was extra, but there's just no staff there. And um, so we were, we went out and had um, hired Christopher Curtis, who was certified. He's retired from the PVPC. So if we look at contracted services in 2023, there was $10,000 for planning and 25,000 for the grant slash MVP consultant. And then in 2024, the 10,000 went away and the 25 dropped down to 10. So I think that's where we saw the savings and contracted services that showed up in the select board staff section. So we saved 25, but gained some. <laughs> Julie's absolutely correct. Some of the responsibilities have been shifted, you know, because uh, you have you have to report. And so the staff is staffing um, has changed on that. So back to this is just occurring to me. You you commented about a personnel policy. What you should be doing is forecasting. And so every time we do something like hire a new person, we should have for should should have forecasting. Big towns that have a million people working for them have the 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 spare capacity to be able to do this. Um, DLS um, provides some support, and I, I, we were working on it last year, but I don't know what happened with it. But it's um, it's still in process. But quite <laughs> frankly, she's asked for additional information, and I haven't had time to address it. Which is just another example of overloading of our staff. But anyways, in a perfect world, we would have we would have a forecasting tool that we would say, okay, I'm going to add this person. Look, over the next five years, this is the impact to our our salary. Mm -hmm. I mean to our, our overall budget. I but I do think with an established class and comp plan, you could we you we could, could do so you could do you I could do that. Like I started looking at it and just like the initial hurdle of getting that tool in place yeah. is pretty significant, which DLS is supposed to help us with. I think once we had it, maintaining it would would be less burdensome right. than the initial um, thing. So many of those things are like that. You know, yeah, I mean, it's just, there are a lot of different things. I mean, we try to keep but on top of that. But I think that's one tool yeah. that would be very useful because then we could, then we could have discussions about it that were reasonable that so we wouldn't just be sitting here saying gosh that's gonna cost a lot of benefits and you know we would have a, a, a an impact that they have they have a similar thing with the capital planning um but you know you you have to gather so much information i mean i yeah. I, I, yeah. I i did go to the webinar on that and yeah it's just so, it's hard so well yeah yeah, it's it's it speaks to the the straight on 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 staff. I mean, when there is an opportunity to be able to invest time into that initial help, it's well worth it in the long run. But um, I know it can't always be done. Well, it can't well, always of, be done right away. One one of the problems is that we're all you know most of us are volunteer boards. You know, I mean, your our capital committee is volunteer, so yeah. it's you don't have so you don't have paid case. staff doing that kind of. Um, data collection that's necessary for the initial thing. So this is not directed at any one person and it actually came up a couple weeks ago in respect to a different position. So it, 
has there does the personnel committee look at the salaries of our people compared to other similar sized towns from perspective of number of people and size of budget and whatever number of roads i don't know do you want to do yeah. that? I, I, I would the say that I talked about. <laughs> we we periodically do the comparison, uh, but it's it's actually so we did the class function years ago. Yeah, and there was a big study then. I remember yes. that. Yeah, and so the recommendation is to periodically do these studies. Uh -huh. I had intended, and I talked to Brenda and personnel board about this. I had intended to start that for a group of positions this year we are in such dire straits, I'm actually afraid to do it. Even though I think it needs to be done, we need to recalibrate for particularly administrative positions because a lot of the positions that look administrative on paper aren't anymore because we are strapped for capacity, which means we encourage our staff that would that their job descriptions say they're administrative support, but they're actually doing things that are outside, you know, the level of expertise you could expect for that job. So we we really do need to look at that and see where people fit both on an internal and an external basis. We have the resources to get other information too, because the Collins Center, which is the group we use to do the class comp, Margaret, um, they are doing they do class comps for other towns which means you can contribute the and then they give you information back we also have the study that the cog does for the county so we've got some similar resources we could look outside the organization but really we need to figure out what people are doing on a pretty regular basis to get an idea of what might have changed in their jobs that would require updating job descriptions or we have those. referring to them. Yes, referring to the job descriptions, getting a position analysis put together from each of the employees that we would, and you can't do the whole thing at once. They recommend that you do a group every year to keep yourself up to date in those various areas. Um, and so that that was the idea is to send out position analysis questionnaires, get an idea of where people are, and then take that information, throw it into a a workbook to do a measurement comparison internally and then see where we sit externally uh, because it gives it the analysis actually brings it right back to a numbers data capture that you can compare and then look at other job look at other similar jobs outside our particular organization and see where they fit in their own class comps or as a measurement can you tell it might be a little off off topic it's definitely pertaining to personnel what um what was the what is the total total dollar value of the what is it two and a half percent colas or two percent colas for fy25 I for non-union that's actually on my list of things to do i just said that to her oh, this morning. Okay. <laughs> i'm okay. sorry margaret that's I have okay <laughs> So I will try to get that to you relatively quickly because that is okay. a, a Next meeting's fine. It's not an emergency, but I think it's something that the FinCom would want to look at. Yeah. What's the impact on bylaw employees as opposed to, because contracts are contracts. Right. The bylaw employee impact of this increase is we aren't sure what, how substantial it's going to be, but if you see it in real dollars against the entire budget, it definitely gives a flavor for what what creates retainage for our employees mm -hmm. and to support serve ongoing services mm -hmm. so that we don't have turnover and so that we can help maintain this level of service that we have. Oh, there's it's definitely a balancing act. Um, but it is also um it is also something I think that is imperative that that we look at um in the whole the whole scheme of reviewing the the budget shortfall. Yeah. We went through this process a couple of years ago, and I want to say the effect was less than 30000 We could do it again. And what is the value of all the steps being, um, all the steps awarded to non-union employees for FY25? Is that, that's probably a little more difficult. It's a little more challenging to yeah. come up with. We would need okay. To and the step is the step is what three percent or two another two and a half or is it two? So and it's, it's zero over year. It's two and a half. 
Mm -hmm. You add the COLA to that, and that is the readjustment that gets put in the classification plan. Okay, so, so that's four case, and a half. A total would be one. Thank you. And it's not I'm urgent. Right, no, I'm, I'm, just... I'm writing myself a note so I can treat that. That's not perfect. Thank you. Just to drag it out a little longer, we've had, um, we've had in over the past few years, we've had a number of positions where the, um, and I'm not saying this shouldn't have happened, where the salary has gone up a lot, um, where we've had, we've either hired new people into the position and in the course of doing that increased it a lot, or we've had a contract negotiation that increased a lot. And if you look at pretty much all of our major positions, maybe except for <coughs> high today, we've had significant changes, increases in the amount that they've been paid. And that was why, that was the 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 rationale behind the question that I asked about whether we're comparing to other people, um, because it would just be interesting to see. Um, because we've had, had turnover, um, it's just as reflective of the market. Um, yes. Yeah. And I'm a really, proponent really... of paying people the proper amount for the work that they're doing. I, I it, I well, think that's important to retain good employees. I was just going to say to get em good employees and then to keep them, you, you, yeah. that we really don't have a choice. And, and, uh, all you're doing really is robbing somebody some, from somebody else's town. There is not a huge influx of mm -hmm. new people. And that was one of the themes at MMA and uh, was that the pool of municipal employees gets smaller every year of experienced municipal employees and and they're not necessarily high on the desirability chart for many young people who are just entering work. So they're, I think they're actually planning to try and maybe MMA and the state trying to encourage programs to train people in these things, which would be great if, if it can come yeah. to fruition. Yeah. One of the ones is uh, town accountants and treasure collectors, and treasure, and treasure collectors, yeah, yeah. it's a and even I county... superintendents. So yeah, I mean, it, it's just the list, and they're very skilled positions. They are right, yeah. and they and in a, if you get a bad person, <laughs> it it is very detrimental to your whole whole operation. So, to the extent that this is all being discussed, I will say one thing: that back, it, you know reinforcing what Tim just said, Tim and Carolyn just said, it has been extremely difficult to hire any position in yes. municipal government mm -hmm. um, because it's not a career path that is, it, you're able to move into quickly. There's a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. and that you pay, a, we've discovered we're paying premiums for that and it's across the board. Mm -hmm. Town administrators and other HR professionals are running into the same thing. So, you know, to the extent that Margaret has lived this world before, I think she, uh, of all of you, has probably been involved in that HR sort of onboard and, and hiring process, but it's almost gotten worse since since COVID. COVID. It has gotten worse since COVID. And <laughs> it, it really has, it's not more. a we are not unaware of, we do the best we can. Mm -hmm. And we do see some limitations, you know, one of the things that will come across, and you'll see it in the warrant, is a request to amend the personnel bylaw because we have some serious deficiencies in the personnel bylaw that we need to address. And the only way to do that is to create a manual so that there's the flexibility to meet the challenges ahead of us. And it's not just benefit related, it's legal requirements on a state and federal level. It's a whole gamut of things. So those things continue to impact our ability to hire as well. We just don't compete the way we used to. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, then you. I'm the one who asked the question. It's my fault. All right. So it has been moved and seconded for select board staff salaries one twenty two fifty one ten at three hundred eighty one thousand and sixty six dollars. Any further discussion? All right. We'll call vote. James can be aside. Margaret Nodwitz, I. Mark Brennan, I. Tula Chalf, and I. Dave Sharp, I. All right, that passes five zero zero. They're dwindling. We lost John. Okay. They did. All right. Um, moving forward.
uh, emergency management budget, which is 291-5400. Yeah. Oh, did you? Oh, okay, I was going to say. Yeah. Sorry. I thought we did. Um, I think you wrote it I mean, I, I let's let's just vote it to be just be Kate on uh, Kate's first. Make a motion to approve um, select board sal staff salaries uh, account 122-5110 in the amount of $381,066. Uh, second. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn, that's aye. I'm pretty sure. Great. Yeah, I whatever. Last week, but okay. Oh, no, that's okay. Sorry, Brenda. No, no, you're good. I, I'm sorry. I, I moved forward. No. So um, the next one is 291-5400 for emergency management for 2800. Do we have a motion? I move to recommend um, the sum of $2,800 for account number 291-5400 emergency management. We have a second. Second. Any discussion, Brenda? Um, I think... Um, it's been proven this year that the stipend that we provide for this position is wholly um, inadequate. inadequate. <laughs> um, but um, it, it, it's being proposed at the same amount. <laughs> I don't know Hopefully if you want to year, it'll be speak any. I, I just... think I think our emergency manager, um, the director, probably had earned two two. But he does have fun when he's out there in the field watching the big trucks. I, I, I can attest to that. I've been out there with him. I can imagine. Um, any further discussion? All right. John, we're on emergency management 291-5400. All right. Roll call vote. James Camby is aye. Margaret Nardowitz aye. Okay. Mark Brennan aye. Julia Chalfin aye. Dave Sharp aye. Sean Presky aye. All right, that passes 600. I make a motion for 291 5400 emergency management at $2,800. Second. All those in favor? Tim LG aye. Carolyn S aye. Okay. Um, keep moving. Be back. Okay, Board oh. of Health Payroll, 512-5110 for $101,769. Wow. All right, do we have a motion? Wait a minute, before we have a motion, you said you don't have revenues yet. I we don't have we increase the revenues by 15 percent um as of january 1st and we don't have any we don't know what the projection we could just take last year's and project 15 a, an additional because it's fairly stable in the sense that oh, we're we're at what twenty eight thousand so far this year and that was through today's date um, yeah we're we're halfway through the year at the old ones and we're 28,000. So. Between uh, septic fees and other board of health fees, right? I think you have it have it on your um, yes. desk there, Carolyn, yeah. I, right? Is that, did I remember that correctly? Uh, 28,350. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is which is still quite a bit more than it was before Alex came and uh, fees were changed at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot more trucks, right? Food trucks. A lot more food trucks. food trucks and stuff like that. I mean, okay. So in we, that, we six, have six, seven, eight months worth. We, pretty much. What what we try to do is anything that is fee based. We we are making sure or trying to make sure that we're covering our costs. Um, there are certain things that are not covered. We have a few hoarding cases every year. We have a few housing cases. We have one in particular that just keeps going on and on. But in general, uh, we try to we're trying to cover our expenses as much as possible. Payroll. Payroll. 
but we, the argument I think is that the the charges should cover the payroll for the most part, with the exception. Well, it should cover the payroll for the things that we charge for, like the truck inspections and whatever. This this reflects we had reduced last year. We reduced the budget because um, we over anticipated um, how uh, how many food trucks or or the how treehouse was going to ramp up. And now that we know we feel pretty more comfortable on their operation and how and how their 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 flow is, we're adding. You know, we went for, we went from thirty hours to twenty hours based um, because we had overestimated what Treehouse was going to ramp up to in the in the year prior. We had gone up to thirty hours, and so we then reduced it back down to twenty. And um, now we're we're re now that we feel more comfortable on what Treehouse will be doing, we're increasing the hours to twenty five a week. So we anticipate that should be covered by uh, fees because the increase is related to the food truck addition. It, we were so very lucky that we have someone who is willing to work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's where the bulk of our work is done. So what is the revenue offset again? The estimated revenue offset for FY25? Are we, we're not there yet? It's not quite finalized yet? or? Well, we, we anticipate that we will be, we're, whatever we do in the, that five-hour increase will be covered. Um, completely because that increase is, is related to the food trucks, a chargeable increase. That's about what $8,000. We just, I'd propose that we hold off on this and maybe address it next week or the week after whenever we have time. Um, and in the meantime, come up with a revenue estimate for yeah, FY25. There's no motion. I, I will I, I can't do it without the information. So no. if I had it, I could certainly help you. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's hard to I mean, in January there are hardly any food trucks compared to July. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Truck season is really is is better weather in general. If yeah. So we'll we'll try to figure that out. Five hours a week at that rate for her is um basically 11,000 something. And I'm sure that you've covered that with the fees, but. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, but so you said 28,000 so far this year and that's eight months worth. So if I just increase that straight, that takes it to 42, it's gone up 15%, so call it 50. So that's 50,000 against 79,000. So there, there's like 30,000 there that's not covered. Um, well, I was going to say, but, Dick, Dick isn't doing anything like, with food trucks. Oh, no, no. Dick just, just does septic systems. So so we're five. talking just just Valerie's salary. Just Valerie's salary. So septic systems don't have fees? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Oh, that's true. Yes, you're right. You do. Yep, that's part oh, but of that's that, not, that, part this, of that 28, 28. You're right. Oh, okay. So if we call it 50, then that's pretty close to covering Valerie. And then there's some other fee for, for Yeah, I was going to say the, the septic fees are a lot less than that. Yeah. It's mostly mostly the the food trucks that that you're getting the fees on right now. Right. The and then there's also some like record keeping or something that he's doing, right? He's he's going yeah. back and and yeah. Um, how frequently does the this is just a general question. How frequently does the town review its fee schedules? Every year? Um well, because we've been um trying to figure out the as the business model for for these food trucks is is changing. For example, a Deerfield Academy and Eagle Brook are the two next big users of food trucks. They it's easier for them to hire a food truck than it is to keep their dining facilities open. So it's not just uh, Berkshire Brew and a Treehouse having you know. Uh, right food trucks. It's everybody is seemingly going to this food truck model. 
Okay. And so we um, have adjusted our fees three times in the last year um, because we're trying to make sure we're covering our costs. Um, so, and we and we've tried different models. What we did do in January, we not only increased the fees, but we've eliminated for Treehouse. This is a pilot, and if it works, then we'll do it with the next two big users, Deerfield Academy and Eagle Brook. Um, is we've eliminated um, any staff time in the filing and the permitting fees coming in. We're just billing at the end of the month. And that would only work with somebody like Deerfield Academy, Eagle Brook, and Treehouse, um, who, you know, we would have enough action on a regular basis that we could bill afterwards. Um, and we have an agreement with them that, that they will follow through with the billing. So it eliminates all the work, staff work here in the offices, because otherwise, you know, all the permitting and the issuing of the permit and all that is gets to be a little bit... Uh, some in this treehouse pilot, Carolyn. This is the one where Treehouse ag agrees to pay a fifty dollar fee for each truck inspection, rather than have the truck owner do it. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. We so, um they they uh whether they pass on the cost themselves and take on that responsibility, or they just eat the cost them whatever. We have no other expense other than that fifty dollar fee. And so that, and we've eliminated all the paperwork associated with it in the, in the like Pat following up on making sure they get the check in, making sure that the, all, all the information is correct, all that stuff. And the fee is slightly higher too, right? It was 35 and now it's Yeah, 50. we went to 50. Oh, okay. I was so. going to say there's, there's still paperwork involved. Valerie's still keeping track of all that. And Pat is still, yeah, but, it's but all, it's just once it's, a month. It's just once a month and Valerie, it's part of her inspection. You know, she's, she's doing the total. She submits the, you know, what, what it is at the end of the month. There's, I see. Pat is completely bypassed. Out, out of it all together. Other Got than it. the original um, permit, uh, operational permit. Okay. That has the to yearly be one that has yeah. to be done. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We seem to have discussed this after all. Do we do we want to hold off? Do we want to? I guess I, I don't think a motion there was. No motion. There's no motion. So, so I would I would suggest see. holding off for the okay. for the revenue yeah, figure. Numbers. All right. We will do that. Um, do we want to board of health expense? This looks like it doesn't have anything to do with the revenue. Yes. Yeah, um, so the board of health the board of health expense. Um we tried to take down as as low as we possibly could on this one. I mean, this there's nothing else that can be cut because I, I knew you were coming back, revisiting everything. And um, I felt that this was, um, I mean, legitimately, we, we this would be the lowest that we could go. Because you have grants that are covering some of the costs. That's yeah. one. Yeah. Some of the costs have been shifted. Um, to our uh, public health excellent grant that we have with Greenfield, uh, Sunderland, Montague, and Shrewsbury and Lever. We get 495000 a year, and it, offs it gives us additional public health nurses and, um, you know, some uh, backup for uh, inspection services, like if Valerie or Dick are sick and or on vacation, and, you know, there's a rotating um, inspector you know, that kind of thing. So you, you, it doesn't replace services, um, but it does um, help cut some of the costs. Like um, the dues, um, all our dues now are, are covered. We, you have to have a certain certifications. So um, we paid uh, the Massachusetts Health Officers Association dues because then a lot of your certifications are free, like Dick and myself um, and um, uh, Valerie could go or whoever can go because we pay the dues. But under the public health grant, it is now um, being paid for. So um, that's okay to be in replaced. There are we some of those that can be replaced. Like I don't the, know if we need a motion on this. We do. We yep. need a motion. Okay. 
Um, I move to recommend $11,575 for account number 512-5400, Board of Health Expense. We have a second. Second. Okay. We already had the discussion. Any questions? <laughs> I don't see any questions. I mean, no further discussion. All righty. Nope. Yeah, it's good. Seems kind of bared down. Uh, we'll call vote. James Camby is aye. Margaret Nardowitz aye. Mark Brennan aye. Julie Chalfin aye. Dave Sharp aye. John Presky aye. Uh, to unanimous six zero zero. Okay. So account number 910-5400 is for unfunded sick leave and vacation for 10,000. Is that 58? Yeah, 58. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Um, All right. Do we have a motion? I move to recommend $10,000 for account number 910-5800 unfunded sick leave and vacation. We have a second. Second. All right. Discussion. Um, we did have a little discussion on this as to whether this was high enough because we do have someone that will be retiring. Um, so the question is: is do we increase this or do we try to increase that particular budget for that expenditure? I don't know. Casey, Casey, and I were just talking about it today. Um, we can vote it at this and use this and put the rest into that budget. budget and hope that that will cover it. Do you have an estimate for what you think this the charge I, is going to be? Just a quickie. I was thinking like eighteen thousand dollars at at a minimum, which then puts stress on us to hire for that position. Um, I don't know what what. Uh, it, yeah, it, just throwing it out there. Okay, so so the budget request is for ten thousand dollars, and the cost you estimate to be eighteen thousand dollars, probably for this one particular person. If if nobody else retires, and there's here. no budgeted amount in that person's departmental budget to cover the other eight thousand, correct? I think it should show appropriately here. If this is where it would normally be paid for, from, I, I mean, it would it, need, though, is it? Really? It depends. It, okay. Yeah. You know, if the person is leaving and and or retiring out of a very large um, budget, like the police budget, it could probably be, be as absorbed in the police budget. And oftentimes it is. Um, so we encourage that to happen. This is supposed to be if there really isn't any room in their budget. And it's hard to know, depending on what date that person retires. Okay. Um, in this case, we think we know the date, providing it doesn't happen earlier. Um, so that would hit in fiscal 25. Do we know if it is the date? If that how accurate that eighteen k is, pardon. Do we know how accurate that eighteen thousand is based upon the date? Uh, no, we don't. I I was just throwing out a number as we were talking today. We yeah, we were talking about it. We know this is coming. Yeah, um, we know the sick we leave. Need to sit down and do that calculation. We weren't able to talk to the treasurer about this one. Right. I suggest we hold on this. I was just until gonna say, just until we find out what the number is gonna be. Okay. All right. All right. I'm happy with that. I, I'd like to close the select board uh, meeting. I have uh, another meeting to go to. Okay. So uh, I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. All those in favor? Can help you. Carolyn Ness, hi. Sorry. Right. Thank you. See you later. Mm -hmm. um, so did we have a motion to table? We do not have a motion. No, I'll, I'll make that motion. And I'll second it. Any discussion on tabling this motion? Uh, roll call vote. Jim? James Camby is aye to table the motion. Margaret Nardo is aye. Mark Brennan aye. Julie Chalfin aye. Dave Sharp aye. John Presky aye. All right. That's unanimous 600 to table it until we know the amount. 
Okay. Um, what else do we have? The, the only one uh, other budget that is on our list for today is the Smith Boat costs. And we did throw something in there for Smith Boat today uh, based on the little bit that we do know. Um, if you want to vote that, or we can wait either way. So and that's just, that's yeah, not a it. separate budget sheet. It's just on the last page of your expense summary. All right. So a significant decrease. Yes. Yes. So last year we were expecting five Smith Boat students. We actually only had one. <laughs> Yeah. On the heck did that happen? We never know how this is going to play out until after the school year starts, unfortunately. Right. So um, we currently have one. Um, Darius is aware of a possible second one, but he said, I often don't know until well after the fact, so it could be mid-April before I have even yeah. even a, a, a number. So we plugged in a third person just, just in case for right now. Okay. So the Smith boat, so you have. So there's a tuition. Um, 72,000 for estimating, tuition. Estimating, estimating the tuition fees again, because um, we don't have a tuition number. And um, if that person requires, um, uh, what's the word for it, Casey? Um, uh, special. Special ed. So that's an additional cost. Yeah, that's an additional cost at the exact rate of what the special education costs are. So it's a pass through essentially. Plus, then we have uh, transportation, and that varies. You can expect transportation to go up. It's gone up in the past two years. Right. So those numbers were plugged in. Uh, I didn't even tell you what I plugged in. So I those numbers were plugged in by me today. <laughs> We talk. Would it help us to wait? And I mean, is there any communication with Smith folk? Or you, I don't, I don't think you'll know anything more. I think we probably if we won't wait. know until mid April at the earliest. And we do communicate on a regular basis, uh, but they are just not forthcoming with information. They don't tell you much. And Darius doesn't know much. And when do they vote their budget? I don't know, but I, the student has till April 1st to. Yeah, they don't even publish. They have, right. So they have a deadline of April 1st to put their requests in. Um, the superintendent has very little latitude to deny it if it falls within the certain programs that Smith Vogue offers. Um, it's, Smith Vogue has to go through their own process and they have waiting lists like last year where there was a waiting list um, for a particular grade. But frankly, they don't even publish the tuition rates until close to April, if not after April 1st. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we looked at last this year's tuition rate and increased it by what, 5%? You know what we did? Um, we, um, I and that was at, your general tuition. Rate. I looked at what we budgeted last year and just added a thousand to it. Yeah. So <laughs> I had looked like at I said, it, it was a way quick and, and dirty. Talked about it, but it, it's essentially, you don't know what that tuition rate is going to go up until Desi publishes it. And in Deerfield case, it's it's a matter of enrollment. Anyway. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a matter of enrollment and what the published rates are. Right. Yeah, we I don't we won't even know what we're paying for the special education for this year until they build that usually in June, May end of May June. So. Um, it, it really is a quite the guesstimate, but I, I think this should cover it, um, providing we don't have more than three students. Right. So we have a large surplus in the current fiscal year. Yes. Okay. Um, we have a motion. I move to recommend the sum of 72,000 for Smith vote tuition. We have a second. Go through the sushi point the hill there. Second it. I kind of feel like we know as much as we're gonna know. Yeah, exactly. It's and mm -hmm. it's as good as it's gonna get, right? Um, it, unless Darius comes back in at the end of March and says, Oh, I've heard there's gonna be five, you know, mm -hmm. which is in kind which of what case happened we last year. This, right. We would have time before town meeting to revisit this, but at this point with the knowledge that we have. Right. 
Any discussion or questions, anybody? I don't want to jump too far ahead, but uh, the, the transportation would be the same, same yeah. issue, basically. Yeah. That's not James's new business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talk Jamie about that every year. We talk about it every year. Yeah, he just oh, buy them a he, car. Yeah, he wants to. <laughs> he wants to buy a van and. Oh, I put that in other towns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you have to pay the person right. to drive it. All right. Any further discussion? No. All right. Roll call vote. James Cambia's eye. Margaret Nardwood's eye. Mark Brennan eye. Julie Chalvin eye. Dave Sharp eye. John Peresky abstain. All right. That's. Five zero one. Anybody want to do transportation? Yes, I'll move to recommend thirty-two thousand dollars for FY twenty-five for Smith Vocational Transportation. We have a second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, John. I mean, how much? That's what about ten thousand dollars per student, roughly. Yep. Um, which is how much a week? Are they picking the students up at their house? Maybe Uber might be cheaper. I don't know. We're paying seriously, uh, huh? We're paying. I want to say a hundred and seventy-five or a hundred and ninety-five per day. Plus, um, there's cost of living adjustments and and um, uh, fuel adjustments that they charge on top of that. I. I have to believe there's a better way. I, I, I don't know if I recall correctly. It, 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 this is regulated, right? It is. We okay. I just, I can't, I can't think of the, the law or regulation that's governing this. I, as much as we'd chapter. love to. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I don't know if it comes under chapter 71 or not, but I, I think it's as much as we'd, we'd like to, oh, 74. I think. Yeah. Okay. I don't know that we can get out of this one easily. Nope. Nope. Pretty much not. We are we are effectively acting as our own school system, John, and that's what the legislation or the statute is designed to do, because you don't have this availability for certain programs, so you have to find a way to get the students that want to be able to go there and do that work to those programs. This is not the worst budget I've ever seen in my life. Ashfield was over five hundred thousand. I, for Smithville, yeah. for Smithville and Franklin Park. Well, we're six sixty for Franklin Park or something. But yeah. Anyways, regardless, um, any so the state, the state is dictating how we do it. Yes, it's an unfunded mandate. Essentially, one of many, as Margaret says. Mm -hmm. Who provides the transportation? Um, we utilize um, Gripco. So, so isn't that a negotiated contract? You have to be able to get that, get the people who are available. It's often not an easy thing to find. Right, but I, I guess just jumping on maybe what part of John's question is: if if there's two kids going, does it cost that much more for three? Is that is that, is that what their response was earlier? That it's ten thousand per child so or is or is that just a simple math that's a simple math yeah so, so what they do is connect the routes for the students so that it's cost effective in terms of time and fuel to get the student down to the school so they manage those routes based on addresses for the students which is how they do it everywhere So that so the cost for one student is probably close to twenty thousand. You add the other two in. I I don't know. I'm just I'm. It, it's incremental, but it also is based on seats, David. The number of seats available in a van. All right. Any further discussion? No. All right. Um, we'll call vote. Jim? James Cambius. 
<laughs> Margaret Nardo with I. <laughs> Mark Brennan, I. Tula Chalf and I. Uh, Dave Sharp, I could. Can I also just make a request? Can we get a copy of the the contract? I don't have a contract. Who who would have that? I would have. Presumably, we well. Presumably, you've just said we've negotiated a contract with Gripco about Smith Volk transportation. I would have to look, David. This actually predates me. Okay. So, but there's some there's some reason that we came up with a thirty thousand dollar number. So somebody must have looked. Estimated cost it, it's talk about every year. It's a real real guess on my part. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought it was. Yeah. Okay. No. It's, it's so, a, not quite finished. We so we can't even calculate that route until we know the addresses of the students. We don't know that by town meeting. So, so it's a, it's a guesstimate that's that's based on experience. So we think it's going to be pretty close to accurate. We, is that what you're saying? Um, what happens is is once this once we're very close to the beginning of the fiscal year, we calculate that route based on what we know for students participation and I sit down and the, we talk about what it's what that route is going to look like and what the cost is going to be it went based out, on a contract you do that with Diane I do talk to oh. Diane every year huh. okay yeah. yeah but it really it depends on how far they have to drive David that but it shouldn't it should but the contract should specify it I guess is what I'm getting at I don't should, I, I honestly have to look at that we usually talk about the route fees um but route to drive the cost. Okay, but you're not just negotiating it on the fly with the bus company when you have these discussions with them about how much to charge for the Smith Vote transportation. I hope. With that contract, since Bernie negotiated the first one, I would need to go back and look and see if I can find it. That is it isn't a contract apparently that is done every year. It's a right. it's a general overall contract that says Gripco will provide transportation. transportations for Smith Folk students for the town of Deerfield. And it probably is is a term that could be extended yearly. Yeah. I don't know because I don't know that I've ever seen the contract. Yeah, but I would need to look. That's it. that's a reasonable question, David. I just haven't looked at it in so long. I can't remember, honestly. And okay, and then the second question, I guess, would be who's negotiating that contract? Is that a Darius contract, or is the fact that it's Smith Vote piece of that contract somehow negotiated by the town, by town administrator or select board, or in the town administrator's office? Like that's what I mean. I haven't looked at this the document in years because it just kept we kept rolling it over. It's the one thing that we did have a constant. Is knowing that we could just that we could have those conversations because unfortunately, like much of the school transportation, there aren't a lot of people that provide this service. I, I totally understand that. I'm just trying to, yeah. I I gather that we apparently do well than otherwise with our current contract, but I think it would also be good to know more precisely how these numbers are derived i was just looking at chapter 74 section 8a transportation mm -hmm. of students and it does seem to indicate that a contract would be through the school committee as opposed to through the town i i could be wrong because we have our home tech our home technical vocational high school franklin right. tech and this is an out of district yes. school so i don't i don't know if this is 100 percent accurate but it seems to indicate the school committee would have some role in this it depends on whether the school committee, see the school committee isn't running out of district placement. Mm -hmm. Effectively, the select board is running out of district placement. Mm -hmm. That was my experience in Asheville when we actually had a group contract that we worked through. What we did do was in Asheville, there were four towns that did this and they had Mohawk take over that contract as part of the regional agreement, but that took five years of work because effectively Mohawk as the region, and I'm not knocking Mohawk, it was just a structure thing. Um, effectively Mohawk sort of handed it back to the towns because they had no oversight hmm. essentially. So it is complicated, I will tell you. Is this a question that Darius could, could answer? I don't know, but I can ask him. I asked him something earlier today or Friday about this. So I can certainly ask. 
you can see what I can find out. So I apologize. I interrupted a vote. Um, so I apologize yeah. for that. Um, John has a question. Um, is this, since it's out of the district you mentioned, is this subject to school choice? Do we get reimbursed for it? Uh, well, we're we're it's a choice out, isn't it? Not coming in, so we're going to be paying for a student leave. So there was only well, we are paying. We're paying Smith Volke, uh right. It's one hundred fifteen thousand, but for school choice, we should be getting money back from somebody no. if it's if it's school choice. It's not school choice. And I can't imagine it would be. No, it is not school choice. The only availability that we ever had to re to get reimbursement from the state, and it was only for transportation, John, was through a reporting mechanism that falls within the chapter. And it's a direct reporting to DESE that you have to do. Generally, the funding is significantly less available to the towns that have to pay this than true transportation funding under Chapter 70 because it's basically an aside. They did at one point, Baker tried to commit, and this was when Baker was still in office, tried to commit to a certain amount spread amongst, there's, a, there's only a small group of, of schools this applies to, but there were times where you got less than 5% of your total transportation costs. And the reporting mechanism was pretty complicated. Um, I remember when I came back to Deerfield, I asked about that but nobody was familiar with how it had to be done. And that was actually a function that I didn't have to do when I was in Asheville. We had a consultant that did that with us. So I didn't have the full functional understanding of how that report went to DESE. Uh, but over the years, it hasn't increased significantly. And you're waiting for my vote, right? No, actually, let's hang on for a second. So Dave asked for that we could see the contract or talk about the contract. Does, does anybody want to hold off on voting this until we see that? Or are we happy with voting as is? I'm happy uh, until we, if, you know, maybe Darius will have the answer or, you know, we could get the contract, contract and answer Dave's question. I kind of put it into that category, Julie, that you said about uh, all these things are going to be revisited. So I, 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 I table something in the middle of a vote. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's kind just, of awkward. We're only five sixths of the way through. Should so. we just finish this off and then make a motion after we're done? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. But why don't we just revisit it later if we want to? The motion can die. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Well, John, would you like to vote? <laughs> I'll abstain. Without the contract, I'm going to abstain. Vote no. Oh, no. Be strong. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm totally That's teasing. Okay. Um, it's five zero one that passes. We will revisit, and we would like to get word back about the contract once you figure that out, and we will revisit this in the future should we need to do so. Um, I'm really out of steam. So, are, are we done? We're not going to do maturing debt tonight, and um, we have um, the. Uh, Warrant, possible warrant. Yeah, in I front of you. Guys you guys can look at. Everybody has a copy that's yep. just for us to look at and think about. Yep. Um, and we can do that. Um, it's public comment. Um, Peter, thanks for sticking with us. Do you have any comment? You're muted. Yeah, I guess I had to unmute myself, um, but I did. I I appreciate watching you folks coordinate tonight. Uh, I, I'm kind of getting back up to speed. I did an awful lot of this a while ago, so learning the dynamics of how the committee is working uh, was very interesting and appropriate. Um, and and I, I was looking forward to the, the debt analysis, but I'll have to wait for another time to do that. But again, it was my pleasure to watch you in action. Uh, I did watch the finance committees in action for quite a few years, so it's it's fun to see how you're working now. Carry <laughs> on the good work. Oh, right. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. All right. So next week we have no 
committee meeting. Tuesday is the Frontier Regional School public hearing. Thursday is the Deerfield Elementary School public hearing. Um, so everybody is welcome to go to those. I'm out of town Thursday, so I'm definitely not going to the Thursday one. I may or may not make Tuesday. Um, okay, I can't make the Tuesday one, but I'll definitely put in the effort to make Thursday. Thursday. I will try to make both since I couldn't go to either last week. Beautiful. All right. Um, and, and then, then be sure to bring me back some numbers. Yeah. <laughs> do you know, okay. Julie, where the uh, frontier, are they going to do it at Frontier? Or are they going to do it here or? Oh, it'll oh. be at Frontier. Okay. They yeah, it it'll be library. in that same, in the in library. Same space. Yep. And Deerfield Elementary will be in the Deerfield Elementary Library. Do you know what time? They are both at 6 p.m. Oh, I'm sorry. I said it wrong. The fifth is Frontier. The sixth is Deerfield. Fifth and sixth. So that's Tuesday and Wednesday. That's what I've I'm... written down. I better double check. Let's believe that for now. And if it's different from that, I will email everybody. Yeah, because I think Darius gave us that. I, but I think it's the oh, that's fifth right. and six. I, I have it on our schedule as the fifth for Frontier and the sixth for DES. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The fifth is the presidential primary. I'm it is. That. It is. Oh. Yeah. It's I, I'm not able to go on Tuesday. All right. And then the following week, March 11th, we'll be back at it. So no um, finance on the fourth. No finance on the fourth. So with that, I think we're ready for a motion. We can do adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Roll call vote very quick. James Camby is aye. Mark Bernardo is aye. Mark Bernardo aye. Julie Schaup and I. Dave Schaup aye. Thank you. John Pareski aye. All right. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. Uh, we adjourned at 7.48 p.m.